If everyone could take their seats, we're going to be starting promptly at 9, folks. Thank you. Folks, if you could take your seats, it's 9 o'clock and we're about ready to start. Gentlemen. Thank you, everyone. If, if you're standing in line to sign up to speak, uh, we'll recognize you when your hearing comes up, um, and then you can do the sign-up sheet afterwards. I don't want to uh, diminish anyone's ability to participate today. Um, today is Tuesday, April 18th, 2023. It's 9 o'clock. We're here in Council Chambers for the hearing examiner's hearings. I'm calling the hearings to order at this time. We are making a change in the agenda. We are taking case number B, which is uh, case number RZN22-000025 first. Uh, we are taking the PDP case second, that would be item number C on the agenda. And we're taking item number A, which is the uh, variance case third. So uh, with, without further ado, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to advise you of a couple of facts that uh, apply to our hearings here today. And um, then we'll get right into the hearings. Um, our process is a little bit different than the process followed in other jurisdictions. In our process, the clerk will read the introduction to the case, and then the clerk will swear in anyone who is testifying. City staff will testify first regarding compliance with public notice. If public notice has, uh, excuse me, if public notice is found to have properly uh, been accomplished, then we go forward with the hearing. If it has not, then other other events follow. Assuming the public notice has been found to be uh, properly done, the applicant goes first and presents an entire case. Um, under the rules that apply here today, uh, the applicant is required to address all the elements of their case in their case in chief. City staff will go second, present their case. Public comment is next. Uh, if you're here for public comment, please make sure that your comments are comprehensive because once public comment is closed, it will not be reopened. We do not put a time li limit on public comment. However, we do ask you to be respectful in your tone. Um, I will listen to everything anyone has to say, and I will take all of your comments very seriously. I want you to understand that if, if you're familiar with how these hearings work, you'll know that that is my prior practice, and that will be my practice today. Um, in exchange, I expect all members of the, of the audience to be respectful of each other. If you don't agree with what someone is saying, please allow them to make their comments without you joining in um, inappropriately. Um, please do not provide comments from your seat. Any comments from your seat will not be accepted. Uh, once public comment is closed, it will not be reopened. Following the closure of public comment, the applicant responds to questions and makes any final comments. Staff will do the same, and then the hearing is concluded. If you have a cell phone with you today, please turn it off or silence it. If possible, take any cell phone conversations outside the room. If you wish to have any private conversations, please move away from the speaker's lectern or the other lectern because all, uh, all conversations will re be recorded. Otherwise, if your conversation is recorded, it becomes part of the public record. If you, as I've already alluded to, if you have comments to make, please come to the microphone at the appropriate time. All testimony must be under oath. Members of the public are asked to use the podium, which is on my left, it's on your right, and the applicant and staff will use the one adjacent to it. Um, anyone who provides testimony is requested to fill out a public participation card. If you have not done that prior to the hearing, please do it after the hearing and provide it to our clerk who is sitting up here uh, among, the, uh, among the other folks. Um, the reason for that is so that we can properly spell your name. If you do provide your email address to receive a copy of the 
hearing examiner's order or recommendation, as the case may be. Please be aware that you, at that point, your email address becomes part of the public record and is available, of course, to the public. With those preliminary comments, um, we're going to go right into the hearings. And as I've already mentioned, we're going to start with case B. Madam Clerk, would you please call case B? Thank you. Case number RZN 22-000025, address 1213 Academy Boulevard, applicant, Ascot Realty Acquisitions USA, LLC. The rezone is a privately initiated case comprising three lots in central Cape Coral near the intersection of Academy Boulevard and Nicholas Parkway. An ordinance is not yet developed. The purpose of the rezoning is to change the property from professional zoning to residential multifamily low, RML zoning. If adopted, the uses permitted are low density multifamily residential such as duplexes and small scale condominiums, apartments, townhouses, or single family residences. Residential densities are permitted up to 16 units per acre. This ordinance affects the zoning map. Staff recommends denial due to the loss of non-residential land at an intersection of major roadways. Furthermore, the city has a deficiency in non-residential land for professional office and retail uses. Loss of professional office land further impairs the city's efforts to support office development near city offices as identified in the city centrum plan. Any persons giving testimony today, if you are able, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Good morning, Mr. Daltrey. Uh, good morning, Madam Hearing Examiner. Uh, for the record, Wyatt Daltrey, Planning Team Coordinator of the City's Planning Division. Prior to the, uh, the presentations, I wanted to inform you that proper notice was provided for this particular case. City of Cape Coral uses three uh, methods of providing notice. So first of those being a notification in the newspaper of record, this being the Fort Myers News Press, which we have done. In addition, uh, we post signs on the subject property, uh, basically notifying the, the surrounding area that a case is, uh, is being proposed for this particular property, which we've done. And lastly, we provide uh, letters to the uh, property owner and the surrounding uh, area 500 feet from the subject property in all directions. Uh, so I just want to give you uh, notice that we provide uh, notice for this case. Thank you. We'll find that notice was properly given. I also want to put on the record that I performed the site visit. Okay. Thank you. Right. Do we have the applicant up, please? Yep. Were you Morning. sworn in, sir? Jonathan Levy. Yes, did you, sw were you sworn in? I, don't, I was not. I don't think you were. All right, hang on a second. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I affirm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is your opportunity to, uh, to address all the elements of your case, Mr. Levy. Thank you. Thank you. Can I show something on the projector? Sure. Uh, I think Mr. Daltrey will help you with that. Thank you. And, and, and you can testify from the uh, from the microphone right next to you if that's easier, sir. Okay. So um, I own twelve nineteen Academy and twelve thirteen Academy. Twelve nineteen is this um, box right under the red one, and that was changed to low rise multifamily. All the borders that adjoin the lot that's in question is all multifamily. We have a fourplex right here, a fiveplex, and another multifamily duplex right here. All this professional area in blue is not developed. So basically, sorry, I'm a little nervous. That's no, okay, take your time, it's okay. So basically, if if this lot is not able to change to low-rise multifamily, then we would have office in between multifamily. I would like to join both lots and create a multifamily project. I, I understand that staff uh, is not supporting your application. However, there are parts of the staff report that appear to favor your case. 
there are various elements of a rezoning case that you're required under the city rules to, um, to address. So let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, other than the parts that uh, Mr. Daltrey's uh, staff report uh, shows disagreement with you, do you want to incorporate the other pieces of his staff report into your presentation? Um, and do you understand what I'm asking you? I think the answer should be yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> because he did go into detail and uh, I respect the decision. Um, for me, when I drive off of Nicholas into Academy, I feel like I'm in a residential area. Um, I feel I, I can only form my opinion on the lot. I do own it, uh, and I do want to develop it, so that's why I'm here. Um, but I do feel, uh, and it's just my opinion, that when you look at everything surrounding, then it makes the most sense to be consistent with everything that borders the property. Um, if I'm unable to change the zoning on this lot, I just feel like the impact for all the residential people that adjoin the borders of the lot, um, to have a business right next to it, uh, I feel like it impacts them more than not. Um, just imagine we had a duplex or a multifamily project and then an office and then another multifamily. So I just feel like it's more consistent if everything was uh, all together. And, I think that uh, it, it could be an, a nice, a nice addition to Academy, uh, and and continue the residential feeling that it has. You said in your letter of intent that the that the property uh, had not been developed since it had been zoned professional, if I remember that correctly. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the the property. I think if it, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't know the exact, I think it's about 20 years um, that it's been zoned. Um, commercial professional or to that nature uh, and no one has developed the property. Um, I like to say that uh, yes there's a lot of land that's not developed uh, near the city and I know that's part of the um, what worries the city about these areas that are close to, to city operation city buildings but the entire strip along Nicholas Parkway uh, which is zoned commercial professional has not been developed. And I feel that this lot being inside and in between residential is not low-hanging fruit for, for the office use. Uh, most of the vacancies in the city is actually, in the commercial side, is actually uh, office space. Um, yes, there's a need for it, I feel, in certain corridors, but this is in, in right uh, in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Um, you know, and... For me, uh, I, I just when I, I purchased the lots with uh, with my gut feeling that I, you know th this can change um, because for me it just made sense and I th and, and I hope it makes sense for the city. Thank you. I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, you might, yeah, I might want to take your phone. Thank you. So, somebody's texting you. They think you're having fun today. So <laughs> I think, think you might want to tell them that's not quite how you feel at the moment. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, Mr. Daltrey, come on up. Thank you. Uh, good morning again, Madam Hearing Examiner. Uh, for the record, again, Wyatt Daltrey playing team, team coordinator, City's Planning Division. Uh, much of what I will be presenting today has already been discussed, but I'll get into some further detail. Uh, this is privately initiated rezone for just over a third of an acre. Applicant is Ascot Realty Acquisitions USA, uh, amending the property from professional to residential multifamily low. Uh, property is located in central Cape Coral or perhaps central east Cape Coral, just on, uh, along Academy Boulevard south of Nicholas Parkway. Uh, this is the aerial and the current future land use of the area in question. As you can see, there's a fair amount of multifamily residential development around the subject parcel, and as was indicated by the applicant, there are existing multifamily uh, developments located uh, adjacent uh, to the north and east of the subject property and the southeast. Um, though the duplex to the north is a non-conforming use and has been for the last uh, roughly three decades. Um, 
further uh, uh, development, further away from this property, you start seeing um, uses like the police station located to the northwest, uh, the former fire station two, uh, the city's, uh, I guess I would, I would say the, the, the uh, satellite uh, city hall use of public works building to the northeast. Uh, there are some um, professional office buildings along Nicholas Parkway that really hasn't moved further uh, away from Nicholas Parkway into the blocks, but certainly along Nicholas Parkway, uh, there are some uh, existing professional office uses. Okay, this shows the current and proposed zoning. The only property you see changing between these two maps is a subject parcel. Basically, it would be uh, a further uh, extension of multifamily northward towards the intersection of Cultural Park slash Academy Boulevard and Nicholas Parkway. Okay, some history. Uh, this area is part of the city centrum uh, concept, and that concept was basically creating a, a government core for Cape Coral. Uh, most communities, your downtown fulfills that role. Cape Coral, that, that's not the case. So we're not currently located near Cape Coral Parkway in Del Prado. City Hall's located in a separate area. So um, those uses such as a, um, ancillary uses such as engineering firms and attorneys firms and things like that aren't located near City Hall. So the idea, and this was about 20 years ago, was to create a, a district that would attract those office uses uh, to the City Hall, the post office, the county government annex, and uh, kind of have a, a separate uh, professional core, if you will, for Cape Coral. Uh, regarding this particular property and its environs, the property adjacent to the south, also owned by the applicant, was rezoned to residential multifamily a little last year. This property had commercial professional up until last year. Uh, there was a land use amendment to change it to mixed use. So mixed use permits either professional office or multifamily and a host of other zoning districts. But uh, it wasn't changed to multifamily because one, I don't, we, we certainly wouldn't have uh, been uh, supportive of it. There's a decent chance council would have denied it. Mixed use, however, it's just, it's a broader land use classification and permits um, is consistent with many more uh, different zoning districts. So um, entering our comprehensive plan and land development code analysis, both the current and proposed zoning are supported by policy 8.5 of the future land use element which uh, involves transitional uses between higher and lower intensity development. A uh, property has 120 feet of frontage on Cultural Park Boulevard. Um, it's near the intersection of two collector roadways, which makes it an average candidate for commercial development. Uh, as part of our analysis, we also looked at section 3.4.6 of the land development, which is something we commonly do for rezones. I will go through each of these points in turn. Uh, the first of the six items that's analyzed within this section is whether the proposed zoning district uh, is consistent with a city comprehensive plan. And the answer is it is. Uh, residential multifamily low is consistent with mixed use. Um, should be noted that professional also is consistent with the current future land use classification. Uh, number two, whether the full range of uses allowed in the proposed zoning district would be compatible with existing uses in the area under consideration. And given what we saw in the aerial and what was already provided in testimony earlier today, surrounding uses are duplexes, some single family housing, some professional office and ancillary retail uses, a full range of permitted uses within the proposed uh, zoning district RML would be compatible with existing uses in the, in the area and uh, would, be, would allow for similar or less intense uses than currently exist in the immediate area. Number three is whether the range of uses allowed the proposed zoning district will be compatible with existing and potential uses in the area under consideration. And, and similar to number two, uses within this district would, should be compatible with existing uses. Uh, again, there's already a lot of residential nearby and adjacent to the subject property. Uh, number four, whether the proposed zoning district will serve a community need or broader public purpose. Now, the city has identified a need for increasing multifamily housing within Cape Coral. This proposed rezone of 0.34 acres may assist in a small way to addressing this. However, we want to also be clear that the city has identified a need for additional non-residential uses to provide sufficient employment opportunities and increased tax base for the community. Rezoning from the existing zoning 
distant uh, district of professional will be contrary to fulfilling this need. This really kind of leads to why staff has been recommending denial, which I'll get to at our conclusion. Number five, characteristics of the proposed rezone area are suitable for the uses permitted. The site meets a minimum lot requirement. There are many uh, properties in this area that are 10 or 15,000 square feet, so it, it certainly is compatible and suitable for this area. And then finally, whether a zoning district other than the district requested will create fewer potential adverse impacts. Now, the existing professional district does not permit for duplexes or multifamily uses, permits the development of offices in low intensity, so it's, again, consistent with the existing land use. Proposed RML would be would be considered to create fewer potential adverse impacts than other multifamily residential uses in the surrounding area, being as the only other uh, multifamily zoning district we have uh, in Cape Coral or standalone multifamily residential is the RMM district that allows for more intense development, has a higher density. So as far as impacts on the surrounding area, this is, the RML would be the lesser of uh, those multifamily zoning districts in, in terms of creating uh, adverse impacts. Uh, to conclude, the city is deficient in both non-residential and multifamily residential land. It's not been our practice in Cape Coral to support relieving one of these deficiencies at the expense of another unless it's been determined that the area is undevelopable due to existing development that, present, that prevents assemblage or lacks visibility. Uh, subject property has direct access to a collector roadway, is proximate to other office uses in the Cape Coral Municipal Center, you know, City Hall, Public Works Building, City Police Station. For those reasons, that's why staff recommends denial. We fully recognize this is kind of a 50-50 case, but that's, uh, um, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I would like to incorporate my staff report into my presentation, and I'll stand by for any questions. I have no questions. Thank you. All right, this is a public hearing. Are there members of the public who wish to provide comment or testimony? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the applicant. Uh, Mr. Levy, could you come up, please? Thank you. you you've heard what uh, Mr. Daltrey has said. Um, it appears that there are portions of his staff report and his testimony which would support your application and portions of his testimony and staff report that don't support it. So would you like to incorporate the parts that do support your application into your presentation? I do. Okay. Anything else you'd like to say? Thank you for your time. Thank you for what? Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Daltrey, anything else? Staff has, noth has nothing else to add. Thank okay. you. Fine. Thank you very much. I'll conclude the hearing at this time, and I will get the, uh, my recommendation out as quickly as possible. Thank you. Mr. Levy, you're free to go. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please call case uh, number PDP 23-00000, I think, one, uh, which is the Coral Lake subdivision case. Case number PDP 23-00001, address Coral Lake subdivision, applicant Baker Brothers, LLC. The applicant is proposing to amend the existing Coral Lake PDP for two tracts of land on the south end of the PDP. The applicant's property is located between the North Cape Industrial Park and the city-owned Academic Village property. The amendment will remove a roadway interconnection between the applicant's property and the Coral Lake PDP and accordingly relieve the applicant from any future obligation regarding a traffic signal and monitoring report related to Coral Lake. The amendment will also remove a restriction that the property be developed with only self-storage uses and allow development consistent with the industrial I zoning district. Any persons giving testimony today, if you are able, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Good morning, Mr. White. Good morning, Madam Hearing Examiner. For the record, Patrick Carlton White, Senior Planner. My credentials may be obtained from the City Clerk's Office. At this point, I'd humbly ask you to recognize me as an expert witness based on prior testimony and my experience uh, as recorded at the Clerk's Office and before you. I will recognize you as an expert based upon your CV, which is on record with the Clerk's Office, also based on your testimony uh, in other hearings regarding issues that are somewhat similar to what we're discussing today. Thank you. 
Thank you. For the record, I will note that this case has been duly advertised. We placed advertisements within the news press. We post signs um, as, as close to the subject property as we could, including special signs near the Coral Lakes neighborhood for the benefit um, of that neighborhood. And we mailed uh, notices to properties within 500 feet of the former PDP itself, not just the subject properties. Thank you, I will find the proper notice was given. I Thank also you. want to put on, on the uh, record that I did perform a site visit. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Mazurkowitz, I see that you are lingering in the background and ready to go, so. Thank Morning, you. Madam Hearing Examiner. Joe Mazurkowitz, President of BJ, BJM Consulting, here on behalf of the applicant, Baker Brothers, LLC. Uh, Madam Hearing Examiner, based on <clears throat> previously submitted CVs and testimony in this venue, I would ask to be uh, recognized as an expert witness for this case. In what area, Mr. Mazurkowitz? In the area of the land use, the PDP process, the PUD process, and specifically with history to this case because I did the original PDP. Oh my goodness. I will find you as an expert based upon your CV, which has been previously multiply uh, su uh, supplied to the city on other occasions, and also based upon your testimony uh, regarding issues that are related to this issue today, and also based upon your comment that you assisted in developing the original PDP. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Hearing Examiner. Uh, specifically with this case, um, I can't believe it, but as I look through my files, I started with the Baker Brothers in October of 2019 to amend the restrictions uh, associated with this uh, piece of zone of uh, industrial zone property as part of the Coral Lakes, original Coral Lakes PDP. And the reason why I raised the question or raised the issue that I was associated with the original PDP, I wanted to put testimony about how that PDP was uh, configured and why it was configured the way it was. Uh, this particular uh, parcel uh, to the south of uh, the existing Coral Lakes subdivision uh, was supposed to be a industrial site for many storage warehouses for the folks living in Coral Lakes. It was a complete unified uh, site that had commercial, industrial, recreation, and residential all on one site. And as, at the time when it was presented to the city, it was quite unique. The interconnectivity was to keep trips within the development. Uh, and so that's, uh, and since that time, I have been developed, uh, been working with uh, two people specifically and, and um, uh, helping a third in making changes to the original PDP. The first change that we made was uh, the uh, piece that Guy Sharon owned. It was the northeast corner where we recently changed it to single family attached from what was there originally. Uh, that PDP uh, was, uh, was going through, has gone through the city. The other piece was the commercial parcel out at the uh, intersection of uh, Coral, Coral Lakes entrance and the Del Prado extension. That was a 30 some acre piece that was originally going to be commercial, it was going to be a shopping center, and uh, maybe some professional offices. Once again, trying to get the uniqueness of everything internal. Every, everything you needed to live in that area was going to be available there. That piece has been uh, recently changed by others uh, to a multifamily piece. And uh, both uh, Ron Inge and Neil Montgomery, the two the representatives of that, that application, have worked with us with this application showing they had no objections to eliminating the roadway and the connectivity to their what was a commercial site uh, from what is going to be uh, an industrial site to the south. To further this, uh, this story, if you will, over the last three years, a couple years ago we did have a meeting with Guy Sharon and uh, members of the, uh, the Coral Lakes uh, residential community. Uh, where we were talking, where Guy uh, presented uh, what he was interested in doing with the Pulte piece, with this piece, and what the out, out parcel was going to do, and what impact that may or may not have on all the citizens. The, uh, we, we were very straightforward as to where we were, what we were planning to do with this piece, and I we literally heard no objections from anyone in the room about no longer taking the would be industrial trips from this site and running it up through their main entrance to their site. So they were in favor of the disconnecting those internal roadways. So we have both Ron Inge, Neil Montgomery, and, and the folks uh, who came to that meeting all speak to the fact there was no, no concern about eliminating the connectivity uh, of the industrial site and taking those trips through their 
uh, main en entrance. Since it was no longer going to be a, uh, it was sold, it was no longer going to be a self-storage facility for the folks who lived there. So let me, I'm going to go through the specifics of, uh, of our case. Now I gave you a little history. Uh, this is um, the Bro Baker Brothers LLC. They own Carl Lake's track C2 and A7. C2 is the larger piece. A7 is a narrow piece across the top of the property. As part of the original development, A7 was a track that was supposed to be a reservation for a right-of-way extending um, northeast 27th lane across the whole property. Uh, unfortunately, the city never recorded an easement on that property. And uh, when it was sold, it was sold uh, to the Baker Brothers uh, as just another track. They found out later that they did have that reservation on it. And part of our application is to take that reservation off of that track. Our, the other reason why this has taken so long is we have gone through, we started originally as a PUD to amend the PDP. Uh, we found that application process was not really a working, a, way, a workable way to amend the existing PDP. So we waited for the staff to develop a new PDP amendment ordinance to take care of that. Uh, they did, and I'm happy to say we were the first one who applied under that new ordinance, why we have number one. Uh, the PDP application is specifically for two, two purposes, separating the property from the requirements of the Coral Lake PDP and eliminating the restrictions on the industrial use in the, in the original PDP agreement. We, uh, we, concur we believe that the eliminations of the internal transportation requirements of the PDP enhance everyone's opportunity to have access to Del Prado. It takes the additional trips from what would be an industrial site. And it, it, once you connect um, Northeast 27th Lane, the industrial trips from the uh, North Cape Industrial Park could go through this, and all of those trips could go up through and connect to Coral Lake's main entrance creating a lot more traffic in that area <clears throat> where it's not needed. Uh, we, uh, we have also uh, requested the industrial zoning that's consistent with the industrial future land use uh, that's on the property, and we've listed a greater list of potential and possible uses on the site rather than the, the limitations uh, that are there on the existing PDP. Just so for the, for the record, we're looking at essential services, educational facilities, vocational schools, essential services facilities, major and minor, boat sales, heavy vehicle sales and rental, vehicle repair, major and minor, vehicle fueling stations, vehicle storage, building and construction with outdoor storage, landscape services with outdoor storages, repair shops, industrial heavy and light, and storage outdoor with and without screens and warehouses. Those are a, a limitation of the ones that are available citywide to industrial zones. We've reduced those uh, with, the, with the limitations on this application. So we really, this, we're only dealing with two things. One, eliminating the internal connectivities to Coral Lakes, which I don't think is anyone would have any opposition to. Secondly, eliminating the cross access which the city wants for the extension of Northeast 27th Lane to um, academic village. If you are aware of the North Cape Industrial Park and the extension of Andalusia through that park, thinking of that as ever going to be anything but a loading and unloading zone for the adjoining industrial is what's going to happen there. You're not going to run four lanes of traffic through that. Bringing additional trips from anywhere through that North Cape Industrial Park makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I know the city transportation planners talked about Lim just leaving it as a vacation for potential use sometime, if come, maybe never, to be honest. And if they would, they would pay for the property and build a road. We want that eliminated. We want that. We want to be able to use both tracks completely for the uses as identified in this application. So it's limiting, expanding the uses, limiting the connectivity, and of course, the one thing that's uh, if we no longer have connectivity to an intersection at uh, Coral, Coral Lake Subdivision and Del Prado, we no longer have the responsibility to contribute uh, to that improvement because we no longer provide trips to that area. If we were providing trips to the area, we would absolutely need to participate in any improvements to that intersection if they ever are needed. But since we are no longer having conductivity to it, no longer providing trips to that area, we believe that it's fair that we are no longer 
to remain responsible for our portion of, of trips to that area when there's improvements are required. That's the extent of our application. That's what we uh, are asking for. We respectfully request uh, that uh, you make a recommendation to approve the city council. Thank you. I have a concern about the, uh, about the number of industrial uses that you're asking for. I recognize that the residential properties are, are not abutting uh, this, let's call it abutting this property, but they're not that far away. And um, I have a concern about the breadth of things you're asking for in the industrial uses. Madam Hearing Examiner, uh, if there's ever a place in Cape Coral you can put industrial, this would be the place. It's adjacent to an industrial park. There is no single family homes anywhere around it. It's surrounded by academic village on, t on two sides, an industrial park on the other side. It's an expansion, a natural expansion of the uh, industrial zoning that exists immediately to the west of this property. Uh, it is going to be buffered in perpetuity from anything around it. It's got the recreational site uh, to the north, separating it from the rest of Coral Lakes. Um, Academic Village is to the east. That is also being looked at as uh, some sort of non-residential development uh, for the city of Cape Coral. So I don't know where else in the city you could put a use, and what I really wanted to do is when I started the application is just go straight industrial zoning with no limitations. Staff thought that that was too much, and so we submitted to and, and uh, worked with the owners to limit those to the list that we have there now. And so we're not incorporating some of the more intense uses that are allowed in industrial in Cape Coral. We have taken some of those off. I understand that. And I suspect we'll have some comment at public comment. Uh, I don't know what they're going to say, but I'm certainly very interested. So we'll, we'll deal with it at the subsequent to that public comment. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. White, you're up. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Hearing Examiner. I have a medium-sized PowerPoint presentation to present. And leading it off, uh, this is PDP 23-1 on April 18th. The owner is the Baker Brothers LLC, represented by Mr. Mazurkowitz and Mr. Maastricht. This is a PDP amendment to remove use restrictions and transportation obligations over two tracks. Those tracks being C2 and A7 within the Coral Lakes as described in Platte Book 80 pages 12 to 28, I swear that aligned on my computer downstairs. The Coral Lakes neighborhood is depicted on the right in red. Uh, it's in the northeast portion of the city. Uh, it abuts Del Prado Boulevard. As I mentioned previously, we mailed with, uh, all properties within 500 feet of the Coral Lakes PDP. And the proposed amendment is on the applicant's two tracks within that PDP on the south end. Identified here as A7 and C2. Uh, you'll note Academic Village uh, lies to the east, the North Cape Industrial Park to the west, Coral Lakes immediately north. Kismet is just off screen to the south. The property is zoned industrial, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, has a future land use of light industrial, as do properties to the west and to the north. Um, and these properties are also similarly zoned industrial. Right now, the academic village is commercial to the east with a mixed use designation, and the Coral Lakes neighborhood is zoned single family R1 mostly uh, with the mixed use designation. Note that the parcel there uh, on the east side, I'm gonna just try and point to it. This, this large parcel here uh, keep an eye on that one, zoning and its future land use. We're going to talk that, about that one a little bit more later. So uh, I, I, too, have a few background slides. In 2003, Ordinance 7103 approved the Coral Lakes PDP. It was approved as a quote-unquote mixed use and industrial development. The original PDP was uh, at that time called Sunset Lakes. It approved two multifamily tracks, a single-family tract, a commercial tract, an industrial tract, and a community residential tract. That was amended in 2004. Uh, a small portion of the P was amended to allow conjoined residential structures and some single family homes. And then in 2015, it was amended again in order to deed uh, a large piece of land on the, on the west end that would accommodate the future extension of Andalusia Boulevard. There was also some additional replatting at that time to accommodate some 
infill development. The future land use of the applicant's property has been industrial since 1989, and the zoning has been industrial since Ordinance 7103. Back in 7103, a master concept plan was approved. That master concept plan uh, basically limited development on C2 to outdoor storage and 150,000 square feet of many warehouse buildings. Note there's no limit, uh, there does not appear to be a limit on the outdoor, st outdoor storage. It was just outdoor storage and then some, uh, a limit on the uh, many warehouses. Uh, the applicant requests to remove this restriction and allow development of the property with uses and densities cons generally consistent with the industrial zoning district. Uh, Mr. Mazurkowitz identified that they have further limited those uses, and, uh, and I'd like to touch on that a little bit later also. The Ordinance 7103's master concept plan did depict uh, two important segments here that I'd like to highlight. One's in red. That is a small local road that was intended to connect to a future right-of-way depicted in blue, the right-of-way depicted in blue being an extension of uh, North, <coughs> excuse me, Northwest 27th Lane, as I recall. So the idea was that, that this uh, storage area would connect to the industrial park to the west, and they would also connect to this future commercial area uh, on what, what we'll call Tract C4, uh, which was to be a, a shopping center, essentially, and, pro and some professional offices, as I recall, uh, with, along with a number of um, commercial out parcels. So the applicant requests to amend this, P the Coral Lakes PDP to remove that roadway interconnection, I'm describing the one in, in red there, to relieve the applicant from any obligation related to any future traffic light as they're not gonna put any new trips where that traffic light would be if that road connection is removed. And similarly, to remove any obligation to contribute to annual, annual traffic monitoring reports f that might uh, warrant or determine whether or not that signal is warranted as again, they're not connecting to that road segment or where that future traffic light would be. Lastly, uh, they are requesting to remove those use restrictions to allow development on the applicant's property with uses generally consistent with the industrial zoning district. So staff reviewed this in accordance with PDP application criteria. Number one, finding that the existing Coral Lakes PDP contains a little under 800 parcels of land. The applicant does, uh, we do have an application from one of the owners of the land in the Coral Lakes de development. So that was fairly easy criteria to meet. The second one is that the owner filing the application has 100% of the property subject to the PDP amendment. Staff found that consistent. And number three, uh, staff found that Tract A7 and C2 on the south end of Coral Lakes are undeveloped. They are, uh, other properties in the PDP do not rely on them for buffering or conservation or water management. That the, the development of tracks A7 or and C2 could hypothetically be done consistent with the industrial zoning district without harming the lands in the Coral Lakes PDP nor surrounding lands of outside of the PDP area and found that criteria met. Uh, staff then wanted to look a little closer at the applicant's request to remove the requirement to develop, uh, remove the requirement that the property be developed with 150,000 square feet of many warehouses and observing to the north, there were existing recreational facilities, the remainder of Coral Lakes being further north. The nearest residential use to the subject property is over 550 feet from the amendment area, and that the Coral Lakes development itself was already built and designed with homes within 200 feet of the existing industrial park. South and southeast is the academic village. Uh, we do not know its ultimately how it will build out. Uh, it has uh, been, I guess, internally and externally called Academic Village, but we know it as a large mixed-use piece of land that the city will do something with at some point in the future. Uh, to the east is a wetland conservation area that is part of Coral Lakes, uh, but it is zoned industrial. To the west is the North Cape Industrial Park. It is nearly completely built out uh, there are, all of these lots have an industrial future land use and industrial zoning and are improved with industrial uses. 
uh, staff originally staff notes that the proposed amendment to remove the use limitation occurs in, a, in an area largely surrounded by non-residential development and has re recommended some conditions regarding screening and buffering of the subject area from the community park facility uh, that are located in staff's recommended conditions. In consideration of the applicant's request to modify transportation conditions, uh, staff does agree that the interconnection of the subject properties with Coral Lakes development to the north and the east, that old, that ex current commercial tract isn't necessary if this property is not gonna develop as many warehouses intended to serve only that neighborhood. If there's no vehicular connection between these two points, between the applicant's property and that Coral Lakes neighborhood, uh, staff does concur that it would that it is the applicant should not be required to contribute to a traffic light on for a road segment for to serve vehicle trips that the applicant will never provide. Similarly, the same applies with monitoring report. Staff also looked at the impact of this request from a variety of different views, finding environmentally that the Coral Lakes project went underwent extensive. Uh, environmental review in the 2000s. Coinciding with the initial PDP, the applicant's properties were cleared in 2005. Uh, vegetation has regrown on the subject properties since 2005. The near, there is a, staff identified a, a nearby existing active eagle nest in the industrial park. If upon mapping a 1,100 foot buffer, the nest clips a small portion of the subject property for which any development would require a bald eagle management plan. The applicant's uh, engineer estimated trip generation to be approximately 214 trips uh, using the general line industrial use. The staff noted that as proposed, these trips would not, these, these trips would connect to Northeast 27th Lane through the industrial park and would not impact Coral Lakes. They'd be headed west rather than northeast. A detailed traffic impact study would be triggered should any development on the property exceed 300 trips. The properties in the urban service infill ordinance or area, ordinance 7103 required a number of uh, on and off-site utility agreements which were completed. So the applicant's property has water and sewer. It does not have irrigation services. Uh, it is within fire station zone five. Uh, it, it, they're expected a minor impact, uh, but that could change once we have a little bit more information on what is proposed. Uh, a similar statement was made by the police department that the location, um, that we, that we will be basically better able to estimate it once we know a little bit more due to the variety of uses that are available within that industrial zoning district. There's no impact on parks and rec, no impact on school capacity as residential uses aren't permitted in the industrial zoning district and the solid waste services for the Coral Lakes development and the applicant's property will be provided by the city's franchise waste hauler. Staff also looked at the comprehensive plan for any applicable provisions related to this, found that the industrial zoning dist district is consistent with the light industrial future land use designation and an economic development policy 3.2 regarding the location of industrial and commercial development. Um, the first one is what's called a commercial node criteria. The industrial zoning district is exempted from that criteria. The second is access to the transportation network, notably proximity to arterials and collectors. Well, the nearest major intersection of Andalusia and Kismet is accessed from the subject property uh, through going through the industrial park. The ex potential extension of Northeast 27th Lane across Tract A7 and to Academic Village, or rather through Academic Village, could potentially provide a second access point, which would possibly reach Del Prado, uh, which is a principal arterial. With respect to utilities, water and sewer are available to the subject property. Uh, staff found that the impacts on environment and adjacent land uses um, warranted a, some additional screening and staff has proposed that in the conditions. Uh, the next item question or questions a focus on scale and clustering and staff found that this 
could be considered clustered with the North Cape Industrial Park, which is immediately in abutting to the west. And depending on what's built in the mixed use, uh, academic village area may be clustered with that as well. And the final uh, item questions developments that uh, will also attract post-secondary education and assets. And uh, I just wasn't able to comment on that one at this time. No educational facilities were proposed. Staff's recommending approval with conditions and I may have to deviate one or two of these conditions on the fly, and I, and I beg your pardon. Uh, the first provision is, is that all provisions and conditions contained in the Sunset Lakes PDP, as approved by Ordinance 7103 and amended by 14104 and 615, shall remain in force and effect, except, except as otherwise noted in this DO. The failure to restrict, uh, restate a provision or condition shall not be interpreted as an intention to delete or alter uh, such provision or condition. The condition number two, uh, the, uh, the applicant and has provided a subset of uses that I would like to adopt as the uh, permitted uses rather than condition two here. Uh, so when when we have a moment, I'd like Mr. Mazurkowitz to reread those for the record and consider those as the only permitted uses on this, on this property. It, they have a smaller set than staff has. Condition three, uh, the vehicular connection between the applicant's property within Tract 5 to Sunset Lakes, Tract 4, as depicted on the concept plan, shall not be required. That condition can remain. That removes that red road segment from being required connecting to the Coral Lakes commercial tract. Condition four, that the transportation condition N3 adopted by ordinance 7103 to require traffic signal at the intersection of Del Prado and the north entrance to Sunset Lake shall not apply to the applicant's property and the applicant should not be obligated to contribute towards the traffic signal due to the removal of the roadway interconnection requirement between the applicant's property and the location of future said traffic light remains. Condition five, that the transportation condition N5 adopted by ordinance 7103 to require annual traffic monitoring reports shall not apply to the applicant's property and the applicant shall not be obligated to contribute funding towards the report due to the removal of the road interconnection requirement between the applicant's property and the Coral Lakes PDP. That condition remains. Condition six, that at the time track C2 is developed consistent with is developed, the applicant shall install a two-lane local road extending northeast 27th lane, consistent with city engineering design standards on tract A7 of a sufficient length to provide an adequate driveway to access tract C2. That condition is good. And condition three, that a minimum 20-foot wide landscape buffer with a minimum 8-foot high opaque fence or wall shall be installed on the existing north property line of tract C2 the landscaping buffer and fence or wall shall be installed and, mentioned and, and maintained in accordance with the City of Cape Coral Land Development Code. That condition remains also. And it is, uh, I don't know if we need another condition or not, but the city is not uh, in support of, re of removing or vacating our cross S access easements over Tract A7. Uh, I believe Mr. Mazurkowicz requested that with his presentation, um, however the city maintains its need, and we want to keep our 60-foot cross-access easement over tracks A7 in the event that road needs to be extended in the f extended further. Uh, I imagine there may be some questions resulting from that presentation. I will stand by uh, for your questions. I do have a question. Um, my first question is, um, it seems like these two requests are intertwined, so I, I'd like to uh, untwine them if that's a concept that makes sense. Um, and, and when I say that, what I'm saying is um, if the city council were to deny the modification in the industrial zoning uh, request that's being made, how would that, and I'm, I'm sorry to ask you this question on the fly, but uh, how would that affect staff's opinion regarding the second request regarding transportation? And the reason I'm asking you that is uh, both you and Mr. Mazurkowitz had indicated that um, the transportation piece was linked to a potential future mini warehouse scenario under the industrial. Well, if city council says, no, we, 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 we want you to keep the mini warehouse, 
um, would that affect staff's opinion regarding this, the second request? I, at that point, that road interconnection would be optional. I don't know that it would be required. The city has certainly experienced a boom in self-storage uh, many warehouse applications this there's a, past. There's a headline in the news press today on that very subject, actually. Uh, I, I don't doubt it for one minute. We, we have a, it'll be talked about tomorrow. Um, the, so it, I would consider it to be optional. I don't, I don't think it would be mandatory that they would interconnect. Coral, Coral Lakes may desire to. If the council were to deny uh, the applicant's request to widen the allowed uses. Um, but wasn't the whole point is that Coral Lakes would have access to the many warehouses without leaving the, leaving the development. So it seemed to me that uh, it, it may be an if then scenario. It could stand it could stand on its own without that access and Coral Lakes could, you know, hypothetically as an option connect to it or, or not. The self storage business seems to be strong enough that it would probably just be fine continuing to run its trips to the industrial park as proposed. Okay, thank you. All right, and then my second question. Um, uh, Mr. Mazurkowicz has indicated there, there would be significant buffering, and obviously that goes without saying, but if there's no irrigation, how does that get accomplished? They'll have to do it with a well. Okay, all right. Uh, no, we don't take testimony from your seat. I, and thank you, Ms. Mazurk, that you have an opportunity to respond. All right. Um, it was a good response, but I'll let him present it since I didn't he hear came it, up so with it. I'll wait on that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. I have no other questions. This is a public hearing. I have a number of cards. Some of you have indicated you may or may not want to speak. So um, as I call your name, uh, please indicate yes or no. And then if you have not been, had an opportunity to submit a card or a, a paper, really, um, to testify and you do wish to testify, that's not a problem. So the first one I have is Mr. Billy Welch. Um, sir, would you like to? Okay, have at it, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm actually here as the president of the Homeowners Association for Coral Lakes. We currently represent 430 single family homes, 66 townhomes, and 230 townhomes being currently built. Um, I'm not going to claim that I'm an expert in this, so please bear with me. All homeowners are experts, sir. Okay. Thank you. Well, trust me, I've been at Coral Lakes for almost 17 years. I was one of the original owners, and uh, we have gone through it. Um, he mentioned that he had a meeting with uh, Guy Sharon. Uh, Guy Sharon was an investor. He was not part of the homeowners association, but he had complete control of Core Lakes at the time. Uh, the homeowners never knew anything that was going on in this, uh, which I guess he didn't feel that we needed to be. We had no idea that that land at the end of Andalusia was being turned over and no longer those homes were to be built. Uh, the homeowners association was based on a total amount of homes and total amount of income coming in to support all of this. Uh, I don't recall ever, even when I purchased my home from Transeastern, which turned into Ingle, which turned into a bankrupt, uh, mentioning anything about any small warehouses being for the community being built on property anywhere. Uh, we were told the only thing that I can honestly recall was that a community college was going to be built across Del Prado, and uh, that never transpired either. Um, we're very concerned about the right of way, uh, Northeast 27th, because it does uh, abut our uh, playground areas. We've got basketball courts there, we've got a, a water uh, retention area. Uh, we've also got two soccer fields, two baseball fields, and an open field that's been used for a number of different things. Pavilions out there, bathrooms. Uh, we've had a six-foot fence, perimeter fence, that's been around the whole property over all of these years, and I can't tell you how many times we've had to repair those fences of people coming through. Uh, we had a number of people that were cutting through Coral Lakes, going into the industrial area, I'm assuming for work area or something. Uh, we finally just gave up and quit 
fixing the fence. And right now it's in disarray. It's just all over the place in the back corner. And we had boulders set in place to keep the cars and trucks from entering through. I don't even know how they did that. I guess it was the folks that lived in Coral Lakes. Or they could have just cut through. Uh, once the boulders were put in place, we didn't have any more problems. Um, I've had a number of times being out at the park myself and uh, witnessing uh, a landscaping company dumping trash and uh, landscape items and stuff, including uh, trees and the uh, pots and everything, in that lot. And I confronted him twice, and he said, well, the owner told me this is his property, he can do whatever he wants. So I, okay, and I didn't confront him any further on that aspect. Um, now, we have a piece of property which can, I think is a preserve area for a lake, and then there's a property that we just found out is just uh, south of that lake that's gonna be part of Core Lake's property. If this track, A2 I believe it is, or C2, is developed, we're not going to have an easement to get to those properties. Wait a minute, sir. Uh, Mr. White, could you put up the map that you had of the property, yes. please, and, and might assist uh, Mr. Welch in his comments. Thank you. I'm going to try to do it electronically. The resolution might be a little better, and then we'll switch to the Elmo if it doesn't work. Uh, that's fine. Mr. Welch, is, is that helpful to you or, or yes, yeah. not really? So if you I can move you it over a little bit, please, Mr. White. Yeah, a little to the other, well, the other way. way. Other way? There we go. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so Very you see helpful. the you. track C2 and how it uh, connects to track 5 and then the, the lake to your right there, just north of track 5. Uh, that belongs to Core Lake's property right now, the, uh, the subdivision. We would have no access to it being cut off by the roadway and everything. Now, there's no fencing around this property currently, so this dumping ground that the whole area has become would continue probably, is my best guess. And who's going to pay to clean these up uh, is part of the answer. We've already put out about $5,000 over the years to clean up old boats and uh, wave runners and everything else back there that the city has told us that we had to do. We had no choice. Uh, they, the city actually came out and put up a barrier over the roadway to stop people from coming in and dumping, and that lasted about a week and a half, and then the gate was torn down and they're back dumping again. Um, now, the noise level from an industrial area for our residents that are on the back streets has been absolutely ridiculous over the years. Uh, there's been a uh, uh, motorboat uh, tuning business, and they ran motorboats up until almost 10 o'clock at night at high speeds, and the noise I could hear, I live in the middle of Core Lakes, and I could hear it. Um, now, you notice as you actually come into City Hall, there is an industrial area up here, and you can see what happens in an industrial area. Depending on the usage, you get piles of trash, cars, equipment, discarded the materials from jobs and everything. They get laid out and it just starts building. This is something that we don't want to see either. Uh, now, we can't totally say that somebody's going to discontinue coming through Coral Lakes to get to work in the industrial area. They could come through, their friends could come through, they could drop them off, running through Coral Lake's uh, guardhouse, drop them at the lake, and they could walk through this fence area that's been torn down so many times. Um, so we're still gonna have this traffic, and that's what concerns us about the traffic light area. If we're gonna get people coming in from all different areas, we're gonna have a different development, we're gonna have the, uh, this industrial track here, this light is going to show up at some point in time, and somebody's going to have to pay for it. And I don't want all my thousand residents to have to pay for this light on their own. This should be, the burden should be met by everyone that uses that track. Um, and then we are concerned about the list of items that are on uh, the list to be used for that property. 
and uh, a number of them I think we've addressed, but the, the filling station was one of them. Uh, anything such as that. Let's see. Now, if this did get approved, uh, then at some point when they decided to go ahead and run now Northeast 27th Terrace all the way to Del Prado, then who's going to pay for that light? And how is it going to interconnect with any other businesses that are there? So I don't think in the instance that this traffic light should be anything that should be removed from the barrier. Um, just bear with me for a minute. <laughs> I've been uh, homeowners association president for a whole week and a half, so. That's okay, take your time. Now, since we, we've seen a huge development within uh, Cape Coral recently, I, everywhere you look there's new construction going on everywhere. Uh, we understand there is a need for storage. So the mini warehouse storage sounded like a great idea when we heard about it. Uh, but that's, I heard about it about three years ago from the uh, manager. I'd never known that it was ever developed for that purpose. None of the homeowners did until all of this kind of came about. Um, so now we have some other members here of the, the board that may have some other questions and want to speak and ask. So, but I ask that please keep in mind the, the cost of this traffic light. Uh, we were told there was a study done at one point and this could cost upwards of almost a million dollars to have this light and the intersection put in there. And I don't think that the Coral Lakes development could bear that cost by itself. Uh, and then if for some reason it is approved, uh, the Coral Lakes would have an easement available to Northeast 27th so that we could continue to have a, an exit plan for the Coral Lakes community in the event that the property, uh, the exit leading out to Del Prado was blocked for whatever reason, whether it be an emergency location or fire or anything like that. Um, we had that uh, Coral Lakes Boulevard was to extend all the way to Andalusia and then with that agreement with the city, uh, we lost that exit. Uh, the property is, the end of Coral Lakes is there with a fence and, and that's it. So we don't have access as a second exit, which was supposed to be there also when I purchased the property 17 years ago. Um, so again, we, we've been under the guise of a, an investor for the last 10 years at Coral Lakes. And just last year, the community was given the ability to actually uh, govern themselves. And it's, it's been a long haul over the 17 years. And I think if you understand from 2006, seven, the development of Coral Lakes uh, started out as an absolutely beautiful idea and a wonderful community. And the developer, Transeastern, uh, made a mistake in their landfill so all of the properties had to be destroyed and then the, the land replaced uh, with, I believe, 18 inches of fill. Then we came up to the Chinese drywall issue with Coral Lakes. Then the property was sold because our uh, developer went into bankruptcy. And uh, it, it's just been a, a total journey, but I've been there the whole time. And uh, I felt like this is something that I wanted to do for the community. And I think speaking, on behalf of the community, I think you should deny the request for this variance and keep it just as it is currently, Madam Chair, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming in today, and I commend you for accepting the presidency. I know sometimes that can be a complicated situation. Yes, it so. is. <laughs> and I, I do want to say, you, you commented on the um, on the recreational facilities. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I, uh, I find them admirable as well. I'm, I'm very impressed by those facilities. Thank so. you. Thank you. All right. All right. The next card I have is um, Paul Gaywood. Mr. Gaywood, do you wish to speak? Come on up. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Paul Gaywood. I lived at 1105 Amber Lake Court. I also serve on, on the board as the treasurer. 
And I just want to reiterate a couple of, a couple of things. <clears throat> when the developer purchased this property, there were guidelines in place <clears throat> that we have to deal with traffic. <clears throat> One of the things that I've learned being in, Carl in the city of Care Carl for the, for the last 13 or 14 years is that this, this city is growing at a rapid rate. And it seems like we were missing some of the forethoughts of build, building sidewalks and the appropriate traffic light at the appropriate intersection as they develop. And the concern that I have as a resident is that <clears throat> even though the city needs a tax base, we also have to realize that each one of these tax base has to be able to be responsible and pay their way. And we don't know exactly, because when we talk about the academic village and the traffic that it might bring, bring in, we can't walk away from this and say, well, I'm not sure if we're going to need a, a, a traffic study and traffic light. And so I would insist, Madam Chair, that we, if we approve this, we also hold this developer accountable to be able to pay his share of the development. And an additional, if it's approved, uh, that instead of a uh, sh shrub would be at least a minimum of eight, eight feet sound barrier wall to, to, to minimize uh, the, uh, the sound barrier. But I would <clears throat> recommend, Madam Chair, that we deny this application and return it to small storage area as, as, it, as it intended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaywood, and thank you for your service to the community. I think that's admirable. All right. Um, the next one I have is, um, looks like uh, Mr. Scott or Ms. Scott. Um, uh, there's no name listed, but there's a uh, W.K. Scott. Did you want to speak, sir? I just wanted to clarify. Well, well come, up, come on up to the, well, wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second, come to the mic. And, and if you could, uh, what's this one? I'd just like to clarify a couple things. If the gentleman could put the, uh, the Sir, could the, you the map up again? Sir, could you state your name for the record, please? My name is William Scott. Thank you. And were you sworn in, sir? I'm sorry. Were you sworn in to speak? I live in Coral Lakes. Your, did you raise your hand? Yes, I did. Okay, go ahead. Thank this you, Mr. One? Scott. Yeah, the, the other one with the blue. The one with the first the blue. one you had up. The, no, the first one that showed the uh, blue roadway. I think it was the black and white one he's talking about. Yeah. My concern is um, the gentleman is saying that they're coming in through 27th Terrace. Now, can I just come over here for a second? Is 27th Terrace, can I ask you, is this the 27th Terrace we're talking about here? This is 27th, can you use a pointer? 27th Lane. Right. That is here. So they're they are going to extend that across the, the, by the ball fields and, and access, or? No, the way, let me get okay. on the mic. Yeah, go ahead. The way the conditions are presently set up, they would build a portion of that blue roadway uh, enough uh, to, a long, to an extent long enough that they can get a driveway off of it to start building their industrial project on track C2. So we do not expect that they will build all of the blue, all of that will extension. That will that road can stay there then, after they built? Will uh, will the which road stay? Well, there? the one in the blue you're talking about. Will that stay by the ball fields after they have built their industrial complex? We would retain the ability to extend that road at a future point. So the city. The city's plan is to have the ability to build the roadway in blue. We're not going to, we can't force the developer to build all of it on their dime. So we were asking that, uh, we were conditioning this PDP amendment that they build enough so that they have a, a working, uh, they have, there's enough room for a uh, driveway that will meet the city's requirements. Then hypothetically it would end, that road would end until a point at that the city determined it was worth the spending the money to extend it to Academic Village. So the traffic on that roadway could be substantial at times. 
Mr. White, I think that's not a question within your purview, so thank you. All right, that's a good question, sir, but uh, I don't believe it would be Mr. Mr. White's uh, job to answer Madam that. Hearing Examiner, I brought our transportation planner if you need her. I okay. appreciate that. I guess it's, there's a major noise level. If that's gonna be a, dry, a driveway, as you said, then there's no real buffer zone between our uh, recreational, the, the ball fields and that, to where they're gonna have their uh, commercial buildings. Is that right? There's no buffer zone? That's something that, that I will ask the uh, applicant's representative to address, sir. Thank you. Because the noise you, level on what they're looking at to put in there could be substantial to those people um, in uh, Keystone Lake Drive where that, that starts to make the turn there and the people along there that back onto that in the, in our commercial or uh, residential property, that could be a, a real substantial noise problem. And that's gonna be an issue. That could eventually cause a situation where someone's property could be, be devalued because of all that noise. It could affect the, the, the property value. And that's a concern of a lot of people in Coral Lakes. The, 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 uh, their property values could decline with that, all that industrial noise. So I'm, I would like to see it declined and leave it as it is for storage. Thank you, Mr. Scott. <clears throat> I appreciate your comments and I appreciate you coming in today. Thank you. All right, the next one I have is uh, Robert and gosh, I think I'm gonna mangle your name, sir. <laughs> and I have to put my glasses on to see it as well. So hang on a second. Uh, Gutler? Gertler. Gertler. I apologize. I come on, come on. Come on up to the uh, to the podium, please, sir. Thank you. The other speakers have covered everything that I would like to speak on. Are you in agreement with them? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for coming today. Appreciate that. So, all right. And I apologize for uh, let's stop pronouncing your name. <laughs> okay. Thank you, um, Greg Bridgewater. Mr. Bridgewater, did you want to speak? Come on up. And you were sworn in, sir, I believe. I was. Thank you. My name is uh, Greg Bridgewater. I live at Coral Lakes. I'm currently the vice president of the HOA, uh, second term um, since our turnover. I do agree with uh, what, we, what my constituents here have agreed upon as far as not allowing this procedure to go through. Um, we, we currently don't have an egress on this backside and for emergency purposes, we, we have been considering this uh, in the HOA, uh, it's been our concern to have an egress, a secondary egress. So we wanna keep that in mind and we were hoping that the city would continue with that road that they're looking at and uh, work with us on that so that we could get that accomplished um, so that we can get that done. The, uh, and I'm also hoping that uh, they, they follow the, the original sales agreement and and keep that at a minimum where we do have just the storage facilities. Um, it's, it's a shame that it was sold off. Um, as Brad said, the uh, guy Schroen was an investor from the East Coast. Um, you know, they sold the, they sold the area off. Uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't agreed upon deal and didn't have to be apparently. So um, the homeowners have taken a loss on that. And um, so I think that uh, we, we're, we're hoping that the city will, will really look this over well and, and come to the proper conclusion that this is probably not the best use of land uh, for what they're proposing. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Yes. Um, and it's not an idle question. Um, was Coral Lakes affected by Hurricane Ian? Yes. Uh, substantially affected? Uh, several homes were damaged and our, all of our clubhouse, our gateway, um, and in some of our pool areas, uh, a lot of tree damage. Um, even in the, uh, we also had the preserve areas. We have several inside Coral Lakes as well as what we were talking about in track five there. And, um, you know, we're, we're responsible for maintaining all that as well. And um, insurance wise, um, we've, we've taken a big hit so far. Um, it's my recollection from other hearings I've had on Coral Lakes that there's only one exit, there's only one egress and that's where the guard Yes, that's the front off to Del Prado. 
And so um, do you know if there were issues with people exiting the property in anticipation of the hurricane, considering there's only one exit? Um, I was not here at the, at the time that the uh, hurricane hit, so I'm not aware of you know, what transpired for, for that, but uh, I'm, I don't know. Um, okay. You know, if there was a fire or whatnot if, in the front of that, we have had uh, some substantial accidents in front of that uh, entranceway. So we also have school buses that drop off there. We have, um, you know, it's, it's the, tra the traffic's run 65, 70 mile an hour through there in a, in a 50 mile an hour zone. And so you can, you, you know, you have the children trying to get on the buses. You have people trying to get out of the community. And now we're having, um, as was told earlier, approximately 700 residences that will be trying to, you know, go in, to and from each day. Um, so also the new track that was put on as you enter the development on the left side there, south side, um, that's going to be another, um, I think, 230 homes as well that, that have the option to come out through our entranceway. And they have the easement way there. So all those people trying to get out in the mornings and the evenings is going to be a burden. So I'm assuming that traffic like is probably going to happen. Uh, you know the, the amount of wrecks we've had already on Del Prado on the North End Extension. And um, so I'm, I'm assuming that that light happens and uh, it's only fair that the whole track, the whole uh, master concept plan pays, contributes to this stoplight um, to make it fair. I mean, I know they say they're not traveling through there, but you know, our taxes, uh, they, they're over the whole city. I'm pay, well, when I pay my taxes, even if I don't drive on a certain road, my tax money still goes to that road. So I feel the same for this for this stoplight. But um, if that's all I have. Do you have any more questions, Madam Chair? No, I don't. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank, Bridgewater. Thank you. And thank you for your service to the community. Thank you. I'm sure it's much appreciated. And thank you for coming today. All right. Um, the next uh, next one I have is um, uh, Keith Wolfen Wolfenden. Was I close? Were you sworn in, sir? Okay, fine. Have a uh, have at it. Thank you. Uh, we just I just recently moved to uh, Coral Lakes to uh, the area, and uh, we have been here for uh, about five months, and we are on Keystone Lake Drive. So I'm directly in the middle of where this is going to be developed. When I looked out the back, um, when we first got to this area, we were having a house built on um, off of Pine Island. And that house, the hurricane destroyed it. It was a brand new build. So um, we were looking for another area, and uh, we found Coral Lakes, and uh, we loved it. It's a gated community. It's it's, it's quiet. Uh, we are directly behind the uh, the ball field, the tennis courts, the basketball courts. You go out there, kids are playing. It's it's a just a great great area back there. Um, the only thing we can see from there, basically, from where we are, if you're looking in the back fields. There, the industrial park, we can see one building in the corner. That's the only thing we can see from where our home is. And, uh, you know, we were looking, I went back there to 27th Lane to where this is coming through. I just want to get a better idea of what this looks like when you're actually out there from that view looking toward the back of our homes. Um, that is going to affect, <laughs> a, I can say just by looking, 40 or 50 homes are be going to be looking at this industrial park. Uh, they're saying about putting a buffer there. It, it's if you're looking out there, they're going to actually, I, I would believe, have to take the woods down uh, beyond the fields, and it'll be totally open. And all you'll see from where we are will be an industrial park. I don't know if they can put up a 20-foot wall. That's going to really do any kind of buffering or a 20-foot. What are they saying? Is that how tall they are saying? Uh, eight foot. I think they were saying 20-foot buffer with an eight-foot wall. From our house, it would have to be a 40-foot wall or 50 foot wall to not be able to see the industrial park that's gonna be back there. I mean, I've gone through that, the industrial park right now. I went, I drove through it just to see. And like I say, from where we are in that part of, in our, where we are, our home is, um, it's, you can like say only see one, the rest of pretty much that whole industrial park, you can't really see it. Um, but if you develop that, you're going to see a very large section. Plus, like I'm saying, I'm concerned about trucks, cars, the safety. I, I don't know 
like I said, I've only been there for five months, but what I'm looking at, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about what this is going to do to the safety of the community and, and visually, like you're saying, to all the homes there, you're going to be looking, I don't know if that's going to really do anything for the home values of the people living there because you're looking directly at a, an industrial park. That's what we'll be looking at. So I just want to voice that and say I'm a little concerned and I'm, you know, I'm not obviously <laughs> in favor of doing that because I think it might, you know, affect, you know, I am worried about what it will do to the other people in our community looking at that and I don't know if that's going to be an issue. I know they're talking about this traffic light. I've only been here for a short time. So um, I really don't know much about that feature, what they're saying. I just know about what I'm looking at. If I look at my backyard, it's a peaceful, really, it's just a nice area if you're looking out there. And I'm just concerned that's going to go away. And I think if this happens, it will. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for coming in today, Mr. Wolfenden. Thank and, you. And I uh, appreciate you, you taking time out of your uh, out of your day to do that. Those are all the cards I have. I did interrupt when you folks were signing in because we were right at nine o'clock. Are there any other uh, folks in the in the? Um, yes, sir. Come on up. And if the gentleman uh, beside you wants to speak as well, he can as well, or, or anyone else. Looks like most of most of the audience has testified. Were you sworn in, sir? Yes. All right. When do you, when do you get to the mic? Could you tell us your name, please? Anthony Bonfanti. I live in Coral Lakes. Could you spell that, please, sir? B O N. I turned a paper in. I'm sorry? I turned a paper in. Oh, okay. Thank you. I didn't realize that. That's fine. Go ahead, yep. sir. Thank you. Okay. A few things I would like to mention. Uh, first off, the owner, like they said, Transeastern, from the original plan, went bankrupt. An investor bought us. Coral Lakes, Southwest Florida, LLC. They sold off 35 acres in the front, held us hostage for 10 years, paid nothing to the HOA. They sold off the townhome section, 288, I think, give or take. They sold off the front parcel, 34 acres, for future development of multifamily, the one that was supposed to be a shopping center. And they apparently sold off this that was originally designed to be storage for our development, right behind our recreational track. So they've taken... Uh, hold, hold on a second. Oh, okay. It, there was a taken, buzz and I couldn't hear you. Go ahead. Thank they've you. taken our assets that were to be part of the original plan sold them off and there was Pulte Homes, Lennar in 2015 it was sold off, 40 or so properties for single family. So they piecemealed out all of our assets and now they want to put this noisy industrial park behind our recreation facilities. And like someone else said, we will be landlocked. We have 60.49 acres of uh, conservation area throughout. And this track five will be landlocked that we are responsible for taking care of. And there's also an eagle's nest that is not in the North Cape. If you look at the eagle nesting geodata, it's actually in the center of one of our preserves within our development. And I just, like someone else said, the boat noise from just one of those that's in the industrial park, revving engines. Now, they want to make it so that they can put in um, so many different things. I worked in a truck garage. And if you get a garage that's gonna be repairing trucks, generally they're repaired at night. It could be a 24 hour operation and that kind of noise. And that is just, I count 12 buildings. How many garage doors in those buildings when they get, if everything's so vague, oh, we'll deal with this future once we get this passed. So there's 12 buildings. They may have 10, 15 garage doors in each building that 
could represent the business and this is the original design of this the way it was approved has been piecemeal out and we basically got screwed they didn't contribute one penny the entire time that they owned that property that they were in control of the HOA we even fought them in court and it was crazy so what would you like to see happen here sir I would see like to see it denied and go with the original mini storage this community could have used outdoor and enclosed storage that's the reason it was designed that way to put that many buildings with the possibility of the noise I understand it's it's a landscape LLC if they wanted to use all that property for a landscape business I don't want to deny someone the ability to do something but what they want to do is just the possibilities are endless for the amount of noise and it would destroy the original idea of the whole community okay, well thank you for your comments today thank you and I appreciate you coming in is there anyone else who'd like to testify uh, who has not yet testified on this matter um, I, I see two of you they haven't said anything yet but I'm not seeing any uh, anybody rushing to the podium so I'm assuming that would be a no so I'm going to close public comment at this time and bring it back to Mr. Mazurkowitz. Mr. Mazurkowitz, I'm sure you have a great deal of food for thought based on public comment. So your turn, sir. Thank you, Madam Hearing Examiner. <clears throat> First of all, uh, I would like to uh, add to my initial presentation that uh, we would like to include the staff report and presentation with the exception of condition number six and the requirement for the cross access agreement for the extension of Northeast 27 into our presentation. Um, we talked about irrigating just before, I'm just gonna go down a list of where the questions came up. Uh, irrigation. Uh, excuse uh, me, I apologize for interrupting you. Um, uh, staff had indicated that you had a revised list of uses. Yes. Uh, I think it, it, if you don't mind, I would request that you start with that and I would request you talk slowly for the, for the future benefit of the hearing examiner? It's, it's not revised, it was in the original letter of intent. Oh, okay. it's in your letter of intent. Right. It's, the, it's it, in the letter of intent, I'll read them back on the record again. Thank it's you. Essential services, educational facilities, vocational schools, essential service facilities, major and minor, boat sales, heavy vehicle sales and rental, ve vehicular repair, major and minor, vehicular fueling station, vehicular storage, vehicle storage, I'm sorry, <clears throat> building and construction with outdoor storage, landscape services with outdoor storage, repair shops, industrial, heavy and light, storage outdoor with and without screens, warehouse. Those are all allowed, uh, are, are some of the ones that are presently allowed in industrial throughout the city. We limited it to that. Um, interesting, just on an aside, presently, I want to identify, we use a lot of pronouns, and we say they. And they say they, and I think the they they're referring to past tense is Guy Sharon, the guy who bought the property from uh, the company that went bankrupt. And he's the one they've had these ongoing activities with. This property was purchased from uh, Guy Sharon by the Baker Brothers years ago. This is the Baker Brothers. They are not part of the group, the they, that they're referring to that they had issues with going back uh, in their Coral Lakes history. I want to make sure that that's clear. These are, these are two uh, ent young entrepreneurs wanting to do good things and presently are actually looking at storage and outdoor storage for the site, believe it or not. Are, are you willing to limit the use? No, I'm not willing to limit it. No, ma'am. Okay. I am just staying to the application. It's just interesting that what all I heard they were they, they I'm wanted gonna, it to happen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you again, Mr. Mazurkowitz. I, I, please excuse me for that. I think our assistant city attorney has a comment. Thank you. Um, good morning, John Eclario, city attorney's office. Just for the record, just reference the letter of intent. I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. Are we talk about the December 19th, 2022 letter. Yes, sir. And then the bottom of page three, we use that paragraph essential services. Yep. yep. Going on to page four. That's yes. your that's, total list. That's the total list. 
Just for the record, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. And I've, that's the exact same list I've read into the record twice now for this. Twice? Okay. Yeah, I read it as part of my presentation. Thank you. So to just go through the uh, irrigation, you can do, there's many ways you can do it. Irrigation for, uh, for uh, a buffer would be uh, on time, on like, excuse me, on-site retention lakes, especially a parcel this big, we could use the on-site retention. We could also do a well uh, in industrial areas. Um, I know uh, Mr. Welch, the president of the HOA, um, I have worked with HOAs. I also share the hearing examiner's uh, Kudos to you for stepping up and doing that, all of you who serve on that boards. Um, we agree, I believe, with most of the folks, most of the recommendations uh, from or concerns about traffic. We are not going to, or our position is not to allow the extension of Northeast 27th Lane through the property at all. We want to, we want to develop track A7 and C2 as one track and not put the road through, but we're gonna have access at the, um, if you can put the graphic back up. Yeah, let, let's do that, yeah. thank you. All right, we got the, we, our access to the site is here, but what we wanna do is we wanna be able to build anywhere within track A1, excuse me, A7 and C2, and not have that road go across the northern end. Secondly, we have, as part of this agreement, what we just now on the record agreed to the conditions is we have to build a buffer and a fence around our property, which is this property here. We are not going to be building uh, a fence or anything around your lake. We're not gonna limit your access to your lake. And this fence will be on the northern end of track A7, which is adjacent to your recreational areas. So the buffer area, both fencing and landscaping, will be on the northern end of this. You won't even see any internal trips within the facility. So I wanted to make that clear. Um, referring to, and concerns about the, you know, you drive through the Vizcaya Industrial Park, <clears throat> as this industrial park under today's uh, requirements, land development regulations, will look nothing like the Vizcaya Industrial Park. Uh, we cannot build like that anymore in Cape Coral. It will it'll, it'll even look better than the existing North Cape Industrial Park to the west because the rules and requirements for developing a city of Cape Coral are far more uh, comprehensive than what they were back then. So it's, please don't think of this as the Vizcaya Industrial Park. Um, concerns about traffic coming through and it will continue to come through is a reason why we should contribute to the light at the intersection um, I would say those are illegal trips going on a non-road, cutting through over property. The actual easement that goes across the southern end here of this lot here has been, we've even agreed with that owner to take, take that easement away. That easement doesn't even exist anymore. Right there. So, to say that we should have to contribute to a light that people illegally go across your property to get to our property uh, makes no sense. That's going, this development will, I believe, do a lot to prevent those illegal trips going through this area because this site will become developed. Um, the other thing I want you to, to be aware is the enhancements to that property uh, will be far greater than the enhancements necessary to the uh, North Cape Industrial Park. So even if you say this is an extension of the North Cape Industrial Park use, it's not an extension of how that was built. This extension of a, of a similar use uh, will be far better and, and much better neighbor than what their, their, uh, their way of doing it was in the North Cape Industrial Park. Uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Gillard talked about everybody paying their way. The reason why the city of Cape Coral is in a predicament it's in now is because we have 90 plus percent residential. Non-residential, specific industrial taxes pay a positive cash flow to the city, very positive cash flow to the city, compared to services rendered in support of that use. This will be a positive cash flow to the city of Cape Coral, just like when you said you pay your, your taxes and you improve roads to other places. Well, you actually pay gas tax to improve in other places in Cape Coral. 
Uh, the taxes coming from this facility will be far and above what it costs to service this facility, so they'll be enhancing all services throughout the city of Cape Coral. Um, the gentleman lives on Keystone Lake Drive. Uh, the buffer will be there, will be succinctly different. It's guaranteed, it's required in the code. It's gonna be different, and we've just agreed to that enhanced buffer uh, as a condition of this development. Um, and the, the one thing was, you know, they sold it off, now they, you know, these are different days. The guy that sold it off, Guy Sharon, is one gentleman. The Baker Brothers are people who bought it and want to develop it and enhance it. They're not the bad guys in this picture. And I, I don't want it to get mixed up with this, they, you know, they are all bad. You're being redundant, Mr. Marzarkou. Well, I, I heard it, I heard the redundancy in the testimony. I want to make sure it's really clear. Your, your position's different days. clear, thank you. All right, I made my point. That's, that's uh, the, the answers to all the questions that I wrote down, so. All right, I have a couple questions of sure. you, sir. Um, in, in your application, you indicated that you had uh, had conversations with uh, various persons. I'm assuming those conversations did not include anyone with any of the HOAs involved. Here. The HOA didn't exist at that time. Guy Sharon was the HOA. With the neighboring property owners then? The neighboring property owners was, yeah, the two people, the other two parcels from Cape uh, Coral Lakes, from Coral Lakes, was uh, Ron Inge and Neil Montgomery from the commercial law parcel, and Guy Sharon, who represented the HOA for Coral Lakes at that time. He, he, that when we started this application, that's who it was. And I've also, in my testimony, talked about the fact that we went up and made a presentation at Coral Lakes, and I didn't hear any concerns about losing the, inco the, the connectivity to this site. That was not an issue at that point. All right, I have two other questions. Uh, the first question is, how do you feel about a wall versus a fence? Doesn't matter to me. Is it gonna to matter to your clients? No, I'm, I don't think it's gonna to matter to them either, whether you build an eight foot concrete block wall or an eight foot wood wall or a fence with uh, buffering. I think walls are ugly. Walls attract um, graffiti. I think a fence with appropriate landscape buffering is what you need to do. An eight foot ficus fence with uh, with trees, uh, intermittent and done properly would be uh, far better well, of a buffer. A wall, you can have a wall with trees as well, but you I can. But I'm saying, you know, is you need just a wall, a, a, a 20 foot wall is ugly. I mean, this is not, you know, we're not we're not separating East Berlin from West Berlin. We don't need a 20 foot wall. A landscape buffer, an enhanced landscape buffer, would do a lot better for the neighbors than what they think. Sometimes, you know, you be careful what you ask for. You may get it. And my last question is, um, I, I seem to recall, and I didn't go back and check my notes, but I seem to recall that you and I had a discussion at one point regarding egress from uh, Coral Lakes in the larger sense. And you and I discussed, if I'm remembering correctly, um, that there was only one egress and potentially that could be problematic for emergency. Yes, ma'am. I would, it, that's in the, I did not realize because when we did the original Coral Lakes, it had a, the secondary access was going to be on the Andalusia extension, which they just, or, or the um, Guy Sharon gave to the city, and I think there's, there's negotiations there with the city as they build that to build them a secondary access point onto that road. I agree, 100%. That would be the best place for it to be. That's what it was originally supposed to be. Okay, I have no other questions. Do you have any other testimony? No, ma'am, thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. White, uh, sir, I'm sorry, public, public uh, comments closed, I'm sorry. Uh, there will be an opportunity. Um, my, my job is to do a recommendation to the city council. There will be an opportunity for you to address the city council when that comes up. And my suggestion is that you, uh, that you bring uh, folks in your community that have concerns, positive or negative, supporting or, or objecting to the application. But I, I, I've closed public comment, sir, I'm sorry. But, and, and, and you could ask him after. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Mazurkowitz would be, um, I wouldn't say happy, but we would be willing to, uh, to meet with you folks after the hearing today. That, that's pretty normal for that to happen. So I'm sorry, Mr. White, I didn't mean to interrupt your presentation. Have I, I'm mainly here in case you have any questions, but I have one brief thing to, to re-emphasize. That is, that tract A7 
uh, at Mr. Mazurkowitz had mentioned building a wall in A7. The city maintains that we want to keep our cross access easements over tract A7. That would prevent him <coughs> from improving that property with a wall. The wall is conditioned to be on tract C2. The cross access easements across A7, which are accompanied by a lake management easement, so you guys can get to your lakes, are important to us. They're platted already and we want to keep them. All right. Um... And I did want to hear, oh, I, I do have a question about emergency egress. Do you have an opinion about emergency egress from Coral Lakes? And perhaps that could be better addressed by transportation um, employee who, who's here today, I don't know. I, I don't think I'd be letting the cat out of the bag to say that the city is currently evaluating options on improving the Andalusia extension at this present time. It's not funded yet, but it's something that we're working on. Is it, is it on the capital plan for funding? I don't think it's, I, I'm, I can't testify as to whether or not it's on a capital plan for funding. Well, we, we have somebody who can testify to that. So let's, is there anything else you'd like to present based on public comment or, or anything else? Uh, I just, I would like to reiterate that the shortened list of uses proposed by Mr. Mr. Mazurkowitz should replace uh, the conditions that I had originally drafted. Uh, that is a shorter list. Um, I believe that the, 20 foot enhanced landscaping buffer and the wall should adequately screen it in. And I'm considering that with the addition that there's also a 60 foot right of way or unimproved area between these two pieces of property. That, that's further distance and screen and buffering. Maybe not buffering, but it's further distancing. Uh, and, and with that, I don't have anything else. Based on public comment, would you support um, elimination of vehicle, vehicular repair from the list of uses? It seems to me that that, uh, and I, I realize I'm thinking about this on the fly, but uh, uh, thinking that that might be the most significant noise generator of all the list of uses the applicant is requesting. We do distinguish between minor and major vehicle repair. Well, like uh, minor is like changing a tire or changing oil. Yeah, it's your quick lubes and things like that. The major or your your larger garages, um, Madam Hearing Examiner, I would defer to you on that. I, I suspect that with the buffering wall, one of those facilities probably wouldn't be enough to disturb the neighbor with the distance and the buffering wall. Um, but I would support your recommendation if that's something you want to eliminate. Okay, thank you very much. And can we hear from the traffic uh, representative today? Thank you. I can't, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I'm afraid that our transportation planner doesn't know if that's on the capital budget either. I, I, wanted, I wanted some other testimony. Oh, she very well. Know. Thank you. Were, you. were you sworn in? Laura Dodd, Principal Transportation Planner for the City of Cape Coral. I was sworn in. Madam Clerk, please enter this testimony into the record. All right, I'm sorry, could you state your last name again? Laura Dodd, I'm the principal transportation planner for the city of Cape Coral. Sorry, I go fast sometimes. That's okay. Uh, we, we've educated Mr. White out of that, so uh, you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can today. Thank you. Wonderful. So in evaluation of this proposal, I tend to look at just some of the aspects associated with transportation planning, primarily 27th. So I would like to focus upon that primary aspect of this proposal. So as it relates to 27th and the city's re requested retention of the cross access easement, I tend to look at things in a vacuum and based upon scaled in to scaled out approach. So on 27th and the cross access, what you have is essentially the ability for a develop to retain and then promote a pass by or a trip distribution to future land use and development areas within the area. So for example, pass by and capture rate for the extension of 27th Street could better allow for the trip distribution 
to not impact the arterials and major collectors in the area. How that relates to the overarching and guiding policies of the city is the city has constrained facilities. Specifically, Del Prado, located to the east, is a constrained facility and a controlled access facility. So that coincides with those plans. And then zooming out even further, I tend to look at the comprehensive plan and where it dictates the city's ability to retain these items and properly control cross access and circulation within development. And to that, I would like to state within our transportation element, goal one, policy 1.1.4, it specifies to encourage the concentration of commercial and industrial development to control and minimize the number of access to arterial road systems. I do believe that with the retention of 27th lane cross access that we are providing for appropriate circulation. Thank you. And uh, do you have an opinion about emergency egress from the development as it relates to this, uh, this particular application? Um, with the plotting and uh, <laughs> the pre-existing community, there may be an opportunity in the future to provide for additional emergency ingress and egress opportunities. However, I think that that is, um, that is in the future and needs to be programmed yet. Um, that will need to be reviewed and then also approved by the fire department. All right, but as, to, as it relates to this application, um, do you have any thoughts or comments about, uh, the, about the applicant's request regarding this, this uh, transportation? Uh, I'm sorry, what was your question, ma'am? I didn't hear you. Do, do you have any thoughts about the, uh, at this time, if, if the city does not have it on the books, and I, and I understand there, there, are many, there are many competing necessities with the city, uh, but if the city does not have a second uh, egress or ingress, um, even at this point, uh, moving into a reality, um, how does that situation apply in your mind to the applicant's request here regarding transportation? I believe at this point in time that the applicant's request for transportation is very much um, subsidiary to the planning department's um, recommendation. Okay, does that mean you're for it or against it? <laughs> uh, I, I support the planning department's recommendation. Understood, I appreciate what you're saying. Thank you very much. Anything else you'd like to testify to? Um, not at this time. I, do with, I would like to point out that um, while I do not generally review specified land uses, this particular concept plan does involve a change in land use which increases the trip distribution through the area. So the internal circulation is more of a factor in determining whether the city should retain the 27th Street access. Thank you very much for your testimony, I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Mazurkos, we don't normally allow further comments from applicants represented, but since we've had substantial testimony since you last spoke, uh, I'm gonna uh, deviate very slightly and briefly from our former process. Very, very, very short. Madam Hearing Examiner, this application does not propose a change in land use. It's presently zoned industrial, uh, land use industrial, it will remain land use industrial. It's presently zoned industrial, it will remain zoned industrial. There is no change in land use with this application. But there is a change in use, but I appreciate what you're saying. Thank you very much and I appreciate your brevity. Uh, I know that there's been uh, some requests from the, from the homeowners to uh, have further dialogue. And uh, Mr. Mazurkowitz, I'm going to ask you to volunteer to have a quick meeting in the hall with, uh, with those representatives. It is, at this point, um, I'm going to take everything under consideration, including all the comments from the folks that showed up today. The reason why I moved around the agenda today was that there were so many representatives of the public, and I'm very, very appreciative of you coming, so I wanted you to have an opportunity to, uh, to participate as rapidly as possible. So thank you for doing that. And at this point, I am now concluding this hearing. I will get the recommendation out as quickly as possible. I will tell you candidly that there are many moving parts of this, as, as everyone here has outlined. And uh, so it may take a little bit of time, but I will do it as quickly as possible. Mr. Mazurkowitz is standing outside in the hall, and he's waiting for you folks to join him. So I am concluding this hearing at this time. Let's take a um, three-minute break so that everyone can uh, exit. Thank you.
ready. All right, uh, so we're back on the record. I'm sorry. We're back on the record. It is 1056. Uh, we are now proceeding with the first case, which is the uh, case number VAR 22-000035. Uh, once again, um, since there was such a substantial um, uh, number of public comment, um, I wanted to uh, have them have their say as quickly and uh, respectfully as I could. So that's why we put the last, uh, the, what, what would have been the first case last, and uh, we're not getting biblical about that. So um, with those preliminary comments, I'm going to ask the clerk to please call the case, and then we'll proceed. Thank you. Case number VAR 22-000035, address 302 Southwest 29th Street, applicant Cape Coral Holdings, HD, LLC, care of Amy Thibault, continued from 3-7-2023. The applicant requests a variance to the front yard setback dimensional requirement for a single-family residential property zoned R1. The variance seeks relief of 6.7 feet, which would reduce the front yard setback from the required 25 feet to 18.3 feet. The applicant stated the variance is necessary as the home was constructed within the front yard setback due to surveyor error, and they cannot obtain a certificate of occupancy otherwise. The change would be for a single parcel measuring approximately 12,369 square feet or 0.28 acres and would not affect the setback requirements, zoning, or future land use of the surrounding property. The City Planning Division has recommended denial of the variance since the applicant failed to meet all seven of the criteria for approval listed in the LDC Section 3.4.3.B, specifically Criteria 1 and 4. Any persons giving testimony today, if you are able, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Even though this is a continued hearing uh, under the uh, case law that we're providing, uh, I'm sorry, that we're uh, proceeding under, uh, this was renoticed. So could you please let us know the details of that? Yes, Madam Hearing Examiner. Anthony Santor, Associate Planner for Cape Coral City Planning Division. My credentials are on file at the City Clerk's Office. City Planning did re-advertise this case. We placed an ad in the local record of paper, uh, the local paper of record, excuse me. We also posted signs with the revised hearing date on the property and notified through written notice to all property owners on the subject property and within 500 feet of the subject property. Thank you. I will find the proper notice was given. The applicant's representative up, please. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Hearing Examiner. Just a moment. While, while you're doing that, I'm assuming that you want to incorporate the testimony um, of your team that was provided at the last hearing into this hearing today. Yes, I was just getting my notes. Sorry. Okay, fine. Um, for the record, Amy Sarah's in Tabot with Pavise Law Firm. I represent the property owner in this case. <clears throat> we would like to adopt the previous testimony provided on March 7th. Um, we would also like to reiterate that we adopt the staff report apart from its findings with regard to criteria one and four, but we do adopt the rest of it. So noted, thank you. So again, this project is located at 302 Southwest 29th Terrace. It's zoned R1 and it's located in the single family future land use category. The variance criteria, again, just to kind of reiterate, we recognize that a variance should only be granted in cases of extreme hardship. I will spare you these slides. Um, and again, we'll emphasize that we are only gonna cover criteria one and four, the first being that we do submit that special conditions and circumstances exist, which are peculiar to the land structure and building involved and which are not applicable to other lands, structures or buildings in the same zoning district. And we also do submit that literal interpretation of the provisions of the regulations would deprive the property owner of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same zoning district under the terms of these regulations. And it would 
and it would cause or impart unnecessary and undue hardship on the property owner. So again, as we discussed before, staff's analysis with regard to criteria one states that there are no unique characteristics to the property involved. And staff's analysis looks solely to the pre-construction pre conditions of a vacant platted lot that has not existed in almost a year and a half at this point. Um, I'd also note that the code does ask us to look not just to the land, but also to the building and the structure involved. So by looking to a past condition of the property, we are ignoring the actual requirements of the code. We need to look at the building and the structure involved. So again, the course of events between obtaining a permit for this build originally in early 2022 um, and now trying, trying to obtain a CO, that really necessitated the variance here today. Um, the property owner did not intend to construct a house in the setback. He didn't. Um, quite frankly, the surveyor did not intend to make the error, the surveying team. Um, players involved here really have clean hands. So we really need to look to the property as it is today, the same as it was when we submitted our application back in the fall. And we do submit that the current configuration, the current configuration of the structures, the way that the existing structure building has been built um, is peculiar. It is not the same as other property owners in this R1 zoning district. And in regard to this criterion, um, sorry, in regard to this criterion, the case law is clear. We look to the peculiarity of this because we're looking to see, is this problem so pervasive that it should be addressed by a quasi-legislative change to the text in the Land Development Code? Is it a pervasive problem? Is the zoning requirement unreasonable as adopted? Or are we submitting that it's unreasonable just as applied to this property in very, very limited, narrow circumstances so as to necessitate a quasi-judicial variance? Here it's the latter. There is no issue with survey errors from what I can tell, um, as Ms. McCarrier tested at the last hearing. She's had a decades-long career. Only two errors have occurred under her supervision in that time. It's very unusual. We're not seeing this all over R1. We're not seeing a bunch of houses being constructed into the front setback because of a survey error. So this is really peculiar, um, and therefore we do meet criterion one. With regard to criterion four, there is a hardship. Staff argues that there is not because Originally, they said that you know moving the house or demolishing and rebuilding, you know, they submitted that that was a hardship. But they first requested that we take a piecemeal approach, which is demolishing the front portion of the structure and then relocate that elsewhere. We discussed that in depth at the last hearing. At the last hearing, there was discussion about changing that and creating a detached garage. And it was for that reason, Madam Hearing Examiner, that you asked us, or that you continued the hearing. And you asked us to provide a cost estimate and a scope of work. Um, you asked us to submit it be, you know, well before notice was to be provided for this hearing. We did that. Um, and then staff came back, and now they are requesting that we just chop off the front 6.7 feet. There's no garage anywhere else. And they want to turn this into a single car garage with the dimensions, meaning the bare... Well, actually, I think they want to deny the variance, but the proposal was to modify uh, modify their recommendation. But go ahead. My apologies. I, I read it differently. It was my understanding that they wanted to deny the variance, citing that there is an alternate site plan. And that brings me to a, a point that I'd like to make. On this slide, I cited a case, Town of Indie Atlantic versus Nance. I believe staff may have leaned in on that case a little bit um, by providing alternate technical requirements and alternate site plan. Um, and I'm going to distinguish that a little bit here. Um, in that case and some of the others, they are referring to pre-development variances being sought. In that one, it was a variance from parking requirements. Um, the property had not yet been developed. And what they had was, they had two 
site plans. They had one that met all of the code requirements. It was feasible, it could be built. The other one did not meet all code requirements. It was sort of a highest and best use and they tried to get the variants to do that, but there was no real hardship there because there was no, um, there was no hardship. There was an alternate site plan that was feasible there. Here, it's distinct. We have a structure that has been built. We have conditions that, are, that were unplanned that we are now trying to remedy. And staff's suggestion would result in a hardship. So bringing us back, staff now suggests that we spend, I believe staff estimated it was somewhere around, I don't know, 60 or $70,000 to demolish the, the garage. Um, that this is the proposal we submitted. Um, staff's proposal does not, first of all, does not factor in the need to change the roof line. The roof also encroaches into the setback. You're only permitted two feet, I believe, um, of an encroachment into the front setback with the roof. So we would have to completely redesign the roof line. This would put it well over $100,000. $100, Further, we provided a cost estimate and a scope of work. The property owner actually provided that um, to me and I provided it to you. The property owner is a Florida licensed general contractor who's been- Excuse me, but do you have that uh, to, to, uh, to show this today? The, the, this is- No, not staff's proposal, but the modification that, uh, that your own contractor provided. Yes, it's, it's this one up here right now. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a yeah. staff proposal. Oh, oh yes, responding, sorry. That's why I thought this was yours. My apologies, I was, okay. I meant that to show that we're, you know, this was our response to staff's yeah, I didn't proposal. I think that was Mr. Santor's uh, Sorry, proposal. my apologies. That's okay. Um, so, you know, this was the cost that was provided by the property owner. He's a Florida licensed general contractor. He has been doing just this, building homes in Cape Coral for 25 years or more. Um, he is in the trenches every day. He knows what this stuff costs. He's working with subs every day. So conversely, staff had rebutted our cost estimate and scope of work, but specifically the cost estimate using a national manual that takes national trends and applies a local mu multiplier to provide that estimate. But you don't have this person with you today to testify. No, unfortunately, he was not able to attend this hearing. Okay, that's a problem, but okay, keep going. Keep so, going. It is my, it's my understanding, uh, based on review of what I could find on the manual, I believe purchasing it was like $1,400, so that didn't happen. Um, but it's my understanding that this really relates to sort of national conditions. It does not take into account the current conditions here in Southwest Florida. And it's well documented, I think you talked about it in the last hearing a little bit, that there has been a development boom in this area for years now. We've had a shortage of labor and materials that happen, I mean, we saw that before Hurricane Ian hit, but now, after being hit with one of the worst storms in recorded history, billions of dollars worth of property damage. This area is being rebuilt slowly, but there is a shortage of materials and a shortage of labor and an even higher demand and basic, economic, basic economics tells us that the prices have increased well, well beyond um, other areas of the country, well beyond what would be normal here if we were using some sort of inflation adjusted number, something like that. What's happening here is truly, truly unique and a national manual does not uh, represent the cost of building right now, today, in Cape Coral, Florida. <clears throat> Further, we don't just look to building costs. Um, we must also look to the fact that every other house in this general vicinity has a two-car garage or greater. Everyone. I looked, I submitted a bunch of LIPA, uh, property pages. You have that today. I submitted them in the records, but I can um, bring them up. I understand that, but but um, when you submit them in advance, um, it's anticipated you would submit them at the hearing as well. Oh. Yeah. Okay. 
they are they are on the computer and she can pull them up and they were submitted yeah. as part of the presentation package that was submitted by staff. Yes. No, I, I appreciate that and I know you're not testifying from your seat, but I will let that go for the moment because we are so I can I can bring them up. So this is 301. Let, let, let me let me do a stop. The, the reason why I'm, I'm raising these things is yes, there are two requirements. One requirement is that you that you provide it in advance, which you did, and the second requirement is that you present it at the hearing so that it can be seen by uh, if anyone's watching this or in the future wants to watch it, but staff can also address it and I can also see it. So yep. uh, so it's not really enough just to do it as a submittal. It has to be actually at the hearing. Okay, and I'm happy to present that. So this is the property directly across the street from the subject property. This is 301 Southwest okay, 29th Terrace. I don't Terrace. see it, so. Oh, it's on the computer. The camera's on you. Oh. There we go. Oh, okay. So I'm going to ignore property values, it's irrelevant, but we are working off of appraisal details here. So, Am I I'm missing it? Anyway, so you can see here that the finished garage is 462 square feet. That is a standard two-car garage from my understanding. And if you do the math, that it, it does sort of add up. Um, I, I don't know how it adds up. Um, okay. You've lost me there. So if you have a 14 by 20 garage, which is what we would be left with, with staff's proposal, that's a one car garage. And I, let me, my apologies. But you're linking that to valuation of, of, the, of the neighboring properties and I'm not Oh, no, the valuation is irrelevant. I'm just trying to show what exists. Okay, go ahead. My apologies. No, you're fine. So, Keep going. I look to Home Depot, I look to JD Power, I look to a variety of sources that I know and trust. So here, generally your standard two car garage has a depth of 20 feet from front to back. The width of the door hangs around 16 feet with the interior width of up to 18 feet. This is a national uh, company, as I recall. Yes. And you're commenting that staff is using national standards and you're saying those aren't appropriate. National so not, cost estimates. I, I understand. But I'm, I'm trying to understand why it's okay to use a national estimate of what's an appropriate garage when it's not okay to use a national standard of costs. It wouldn't be more appropriate to use what is normal in Cape Coral for the size of the garage apples to apples. Right. I'm, I'm just using these measurements to show how many cars can fit into a garage. Okay, keep going. And that's because the cars that we drive here are the same as the cars that are driven in Ohio or California, Texas, but the building, the cost to build a house in one of those places is not the same as it is here for a variety of reasons. Keep going. Okay. So most standard two car garages are somewhere around 18 to 20 feet. They can be a little bit bigger, 22 by 22. So if we do the math, about 20 by 20, that's about 400 square feet. So if we see something that's really 360 square feet and up, we're looking at a two car garage. So that brings me to the other properties. This is again, 301 Southwest 29th Terrace. This is the property across the street. Their finished garage is 462 square feet. So that would be around a two-car garage. Doesn't this whole line of argument go against your requesting the variance? Because the other property owners in the neighborhood were able to build within the requirements of the city, and you're saying that your client was not able to do that. So it doesn't exactly go to the contrary of your argument? Not quite. <laughs> we would have been able to build strictly within the parameters of the code. And we were planning on that. There was no intention to try to deviate from the code at all. A human error happened. We've all made mistakes like this. And quite frankly, the law does, I think, 
fit in nicely, particularly with this type of request, because obviously zoning is a function of the city's police power. It is in place because the city has the rights to obviously regulate for the public health, safety, and welfare. Um, but in certain instances, strict application of an otherwise valid zoning ordinance like these front setbacks, I don't dispute that they are otherwise valid as applied to most other properties, um, as applied here to where the structure's already been built, it was accidentally constructed in the front setback. Strict application of that would require a tremendous amount of work to end up with a single car garage, which is not in character with the rest of the area. There's, that's a right to have a two car garage that's commonly enjoyed by other residents in the R1 zoning district and yet we would be deprived of that simply because there's a survey error. And I might add that this is a corner lot, so the front setback is 25 feet, but the side setback is 10. And I'm gonna pull up the presentation just to show you how this is laid out, if I can find it. So we have about 27 and a half feet over here, and we have 18.3 feet over here. And from just a visibility standard, if we're looking at a visibility triangle, um, if we're looking at the, really the most important thing that we would look at with public health, safety, and welfare, which uh, is safety with the setback, the visibility triangle. If the front door was on the east side of this structure, this would comply with the zoning code. It would be set back. The front setback would be more than 25 feet from Southwest Third Avenue. The side setback would be more than 10 feet from Southwest 29th Street. There's no issue really from a safety or public welfare con consideration with regard to the way that this is laid out. This was an error. We do not anticipate this happening ever again. I can, I would probably bet a lot of money that um, JHM surveying will not let this happen again anytime soon. This is just a human error that we are trying to fix without expending hundreds of thousands of dollars to end up with a single car garage. And there, there's case law that does, again, it does speak to this. Even, even in extreme situations where the denial of a variance would go beyond the constitutional limits of police power to protect the public, a denial would be considered a confiscation of a right. This is discussed um, in a case out of the third DCA, Metro Metropolitan Dade County versus Rhining. Again, here, there's no issue that relates to the public health, safety, and welfare. This was an error. Nobody is objecting. Staff has found specifically that there is no detriment to the public health, safety, and welfare by keeping this in this location. Cutting off 6.7 feet of the garage and a little chunk of the bathroom and a cost that's upward of you know $100,000 at this point, redoing the roof line, redoing all of that, just because there was a survey error, a human mistake with no aesthetic issue. If you drive down the street, it doesn't look odd. It's not out of place. Well, I, I, actually, I, I, I think it does look out of place, but okay, go ahead. And Again, I, I don't think it does. I think it looks just fine. We haven't had any neighbors that have opposed this, not that that is dispositive of the issue, of course, but I think it is circumstantial evidence to indicate that there's really no concern here other than the fact that it doesn't strictly comply with the zoning code. It is just that principle. And conversely, there is an unnecessary and undue hardship. It's the cost. It's a smaller garage. And we're looking at one of my main points that I'm just getting to is the fact that we have really strict parking requirements in Cape Coral. You cannot park a boat trailer anywhere on your property except in the garage. Many boat trailers are longer than 20 feet. So it would exceed the size of this garage. It wouldn't fit. Many people have both boat trailers and commercial vehicles. So maybe you have a little GINU, but you also you know, own a plumbing business and you have your plumbing logo on the side of your car. Which one goes in your garage? 
Other residents in this district do not have to make that decision. They all have two car garages. I have looked at Zillow multiple times, not that this is scientific evidence, but I have not seen a single house for sale in Cape Coral that does not have at least a two car garage, not a single family house. I didn't look at duplexes or multifamily because it's not relevant here. The evidence goes to show us that almost every other house, from what I can see, from the information available to me, does have a two-car garage. This one would not unless the variance is granted. I'll save the rest for my closing, but I'm open to any questions you may have. Thank you. You said that the, that the, um, that the contractor and the surveyor had, uh, had clean hands, but there was an error made. How does that, how does that link up with clean hands? I mean, if, if it was an unintentional error, it was still an error, so I'm not understanding your logic here. There's some case law that um, does speak to variances that are sought after the fact, meaning that somebody installed something, for example, a pool cage. Right, they put it in without a permit. You know that you need a permit to get a pool cage. Anybody who's installing a pool cage knows that you need a permit, and they willingly went in and put it in without a permit and then came back and tried to get a variance. Here, a permit was pulled. The permit identified this house shifted back about 6.7 feet. That's the intention, that was the intention of the contractor, the surveyor, the city, everybody involved intended for this to comply in every way, shape, and form with what was on the permit, and a simple human error resulted in a pretty big mess. What, what, what do we do if, if, uh, if, I don't know, more people say, wow, I can just come in and say I made a mistake and I can get what I want. I'm not, I mean, doesn't this set a precedent for other people that perhaps not, may not be as honest as you and your clients are. No, in fact, the Florida case law is pretty clear that simply because a variance is granted in one instance does not set a precedent that it should be granted in other instances. I, I'm aware of that, but still, you're saying that, well, this is, this is peculiar to the land. Why is it peculiar to land because, or peculiar to the property, excuse me, because your client made a mis allegedly made a mistake? I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing that linkage there. It's peculiar to the property because if you look at the conditions now, this is what it is. It does encroach. You don't see it everywhere. Most of these other homes that were built did not have any type of survey error. Sometimes we see, you know, small little ones and we can adjust for that or we can get an administrative variance. Um, okay, I, I understand what you're saying. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, if there's nothing else, let's have staff up. Good morning, Madam Hearing Examiner. Again, for the record, Anthony Santor, Associate Planner for Cape Coral City Planning Division. Uh, I would like to first off incorporate the previous testimony and staff reports from the previous meeting. You're talking about your staff, your, your staff, I'm sorry, you're talking about your testimony, correct? Uh, my testimony and the testimony of counselor and her witnesses. I will do so, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would also like to be at this time recognized as an expert witness in the field of architecture and environmental design based off of my qualifications and testimony previously uh, for my qualifications to Madam Hearing Examiner before this case. And I will recognize, recognize you as an expert based upon your CV, which you have previously provided, and also based upon your testimony regarding uh, matters that are relevant to this case. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so to begin on this case, before I do get into the case itself, I do want to commend Council, uh, the applicant and the property owner for getting me the material and getting staff the material well before the time we had specified. Um, they went above and beyond in that and it's really appreciative. So I do wanna thank them for that. Uh, so I'll give a, a slight background. Um, so again, this case is variance 2235. Um, the address is at 302 Southwest 29th Street. The request is for a variance of 6.7 feet to the front yard setback requirement of 25 feet. As indicated in LDC table 4.1.3.B, it would take the front yard setback requirement from 25 feet down to 18.3 feet for this specific subject property. Uh, the site was and is approximately 12,369 square feet, which is roughly 0.28 acres. 
It does have the future land use classification of SF and it is zoned R1. And it was developed with a fully permitted uh, single family residence uh, with that permit number being B21-27441. I will not go through the entirety of the case again for brevity's sake, um, but I do just wanna highlight a couple of items. Uh, here we can see the proposed property and the surrounding location out to uh, an estimate of 500 feet at the dashed line, and then just the future land use. This was the original survey that was submitted um, with the application. There was a revised survey submitted, uh, which the only addition is the inclusion of the dimension line illustrating the encroachment of the space here. You can see where the cursor currently is. There is a approximate 0.6 um, projection into the front yard setback in addition to the one that is for the garage space. So I, I just do want to note that it was submitted for clarification to show that that was indeed encroachment. Uh, this was the existing thing. So <clears throat> we'll move to the very first section, which uh, I'll just highlight again, staff stating that the applicant did not meet this criteria, and that specifically is 3.4.3.B.1, that special conditions and circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land structure or building involved and which are not applicable to other land structures or buildings in the same zoning district as staff had testified previously. The reason for looking at the pre-construction lot for the variance request is the fact that the lot itself is the determining factor and the request itself is a request from a lot dimension. And that lot dimension, when it looks at the um, existence of peculiar, peculiarities, excuse me, it's a very hard word to say, uh, in the lot goes to items that in, inhibit or promote a necessity for a variance. A improper construction or placement of the building within that lot is not particularly something that exists within the current confines of the lot itself. Following counselor's train of logic, every applicant seeking a variance, when they submit due to the nature of their lot, uh, which every lot is different by even one square foot, and every variance request is different, the fact that it is constructed then would automatically meet that definition. That is not the intent of the code. That is not the way it is specified. The specification we do have to remember for this section is that items may be sought from a variance from both chapter four dimensional standards and article five, which is our building construction standards for uh, residential and non-residential design standards. So in the inclusion of a catch-all case for the variance, which it takes into account both a variance sought from dimensional standards and a variance sought from building standards, the code was written in such a way that would be able to cover the items that are specific to that variance request, i.e., is it a lot request that's being asked? Is it a building request? And so the code is written to reflect that. So in looking at this, and staff has also noted in the applicant and the applicant's witnesses have noticed that the construction of the building is very typical, along with the aesthetic design of the building, is very typical in that there is no structural or building um, peculiar, peculiarities, again, which uh, cause or necessitate the uh, variance. It is strictly a locational request because the building was constructed incorrectly within the front yard setback. And for these reasons, staff had found that the applicant did not meet the requirement and it reaffirms its recommendation that they did not meet this requirement as well. Are you saying if they had applied under a different, uh, under a different theory that you would have a different opinion, hypothetically, since they did not do so? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. My, my, my thoughts in reviewing the case, regardless of the applicant's uh, causation for why it was constructed, would still be the same. It still is a property that was, con that was built within the front yard setback. There is no uh, peculiarities from the building or special causes for the building's design, which necessitate a forward posi position excuse me, into the front yard setback that is not consistent with the R1 zoning district and the applicable properties that surround it. Thank you, go ahead. 
Uh, we will skip section 3.4.B.2 as that was discussed previously and staff does feel that the applicant met that requirement. Uh, as well as 3.4.3.B.3, again, the staff feels that the applicant met that requirement as well. We'll move into um, criteria 3.4.3.B, and specifically, I do want to highlight that staff does agree that the cost of demolition and specific reconstruction or relocation of the structure due to the cost associated with that, which could be very, um, very high, would be something that could be construed as a hardship. So staff does not object to that being considered uh, specific hardships or um, determining factors. However, staff did note that cost of partial demolition and reconstruction or alternate designs and construction solutions may be practical and reduce the cost burden below the level of hardship. This was uh, talked about at length at the previous hearing and staff did provide a recommendation or a posited solution at that for relocation of a detached garage. However, that posited solution was in direct response to the applicant's witness, the property owner who stated that the interior dimensions of the garage space were not capable of providing a code compliance space for a garage as is required by the city of Cape Coral. So in light of that testimony, staff had posited, well, there are other design solutions, this being one of them. So based upon that, the applicant and the instructions from Madden Hearing Examiner, the applicant provided two sets of detailed scope of work for the new addition of the garage and the remodeling of the house. Those were provided on 32823. Uh, within the scope of work, the applicant denoted the cost associated with the construction of the new garage, as well as the cost of renovating the existing structure to comply with the required front yard setback of 25 feet. So their, their uh, costs came out for new garage addition, which we had seen the applicant had presented, um, a $89,600 base cost and a $103,040 total cost. Uh, for demolition work, that's that 6.5 existing as noted, but I'm assuming it was a 6.7 existing to comply with the code, it was 69,400 base and 79,810 total. In the scope of work email distributed from MMC National to Ms. DeBeau on 32823, Mr. Man Mark Tins noted that, note, side garage, it does not exhibit the space required by city code. So I'm assuming that was in reference to the existing garage or the construction of the new garage. It was not specified. That was just the language that was in there. Um, the, the applicant also transmitted a revised survey of the property, which we have covered, that showed that additional 0.6 projection into the front yard setback for the left portion of the house, which turns out to be a bathroom, specifically the shower room. Uh, here are that scope of work, again, taken from the submissions. Uh, this was done by Mr. Martins uh, from MMC National Inc. and from Mays Construction, LLC, submitted on 32823, and we see those costs associated broke down with specific cost, um, however, not broken down by specific trade, but broken down by, I'm assuming, um, specific scope of work uh, estimates that were provided. Uh, there, I would also like to note this was the other document was submitted was just the cleaned up version, which provided a little bit more insight um, into it along with additional base costs. So as part of staff's due diligence in looking at and providing estimates uh, that are applicable to the scope of work, Staff looked at the revised survey to determine what projections were occurring and which would need to be rectified in the solu a possible solution for conformance with the code and noted that we now have the two projections, which are the 18.3 foot front yard setback, which is the 6.7 foot projection for the garage surface to the outermost projection of the garage and the 0.6 projection for the shower area on the left portion of the building. You'll see those highlighted here and here. Also as part of staff's due diligence to understand the systems that exist and that would have to be renovated or remodeled or relocated in, construct in the carrying out of any type of solution, staff went back to the original permitted documents to determine what the inside actually looked like and where certain systems were located. And it was within looking at this that staff did notice 
that the interior garage dimension from the main separation wall from the garage space to the outermost projection is 22 feet 3 inches. We also noticed that the dimension for the bath space from the wet wall, assuming non-finished material as there was no specification, um, but assuming from framing material to exterior of structural material was four feet five and a half inches. So getting into the land development code itself, the city requires a minimum garage space per the land development code, which can be found in volume two, article five, chapter two, section 5.2.4.a, quote, all single-family detached and single-family semi-detached dwelling units and each unit of a duplex structures shall include a garage with a minimum dimensions of 14 feet by 20 feet unobstructed space. Obviously, this means clear space um, from wall finish to wall finish. Note it does not specify orientations must be in certain directions. Garage doors need to be provided at certain locations. However, obviously, construction, you'd want to be it in the perfect the perpendicular direction for garage, obviously for car access. So if we're looking at the front setback to the closest exterior wall per the revised site plan, we have a setback of 18.3 feet. Assuming the interior garage dimension that we have off of the plan is accurate, which there is no reason for it not to be if the, plan, if the house was constructed according to the plans, we have a clear space from the for structure of the demising wall to the exterior face of the structure for the garage, which is 22.25 feet, or that's that 22.3 feet that we saw in the plan. The required front yard setback is 25 feet, a relief of 6.7, that's obviously as the requested variance is uh, asking for. So if we were to break this down and we look, like, we look at the 22.25 garage dimension, we subtract that 6.7 foot dimension of the variance request, which is the difference to make up that front yard setback, we get 15.55 feet to the exterior face of the CMU, which is the concrete masonry unit, which the house is primarily constructed out of on the exterior wall. Within that 15.55, which would be the new garage dimension uh, from the demising wall to the exterior face, we remove 0.67, uh, accounting for an eight inch CMU, and an eight inch CMU is not eight inches, it is seven five eighths. Uh, however, use eight inch because it's very nominal and easy for us to calculate. Um, we get a 14.88 clear interior width. Now, that still needs to account for interior finishes because we're going from structural to structural. So if we take that 14.88 clear width and we subtract about 0.17, which is about two inches of wall finish for one wall, and 0.17, which is another two inches for the other wall, and that's assuming uh, insulation, although in looking at the uh, garage detailing for the walls, there was no uh, insulation accounted for on those, but assuming there are insulation requirements and maybe double layers of gyp or other specific, uh, gyp board, excuse me, which is drywall, other specific items, we, it gives a buffer. What we get is a unobstructed width of 14.54 feet. Uh, obviously, 14.54 of clear width is greater than the 14 foot that is required. The garage length per the floor plan is over 30 feet, uh, roughly, and that's exterior to exterior. If we subtract the interior walls again, what we get is a 28.66 feet provided, which obviously complies with the 20 foot requirement. So staff went back and looked at, okay, so how would this lay out in the space itself? Well, obviously there is a space within there that can be provided meeting the applicable zoning code where you would see the garage come out that required width in order to make the uh, project comply with the zoning code. The garage door system and the driveway system, yeah, excuse me, would be relocated off to the side uh, to exit onto the, uh, arterial, the corner lot side yard. And the area of the existing garage that is proud of that 25 feet can obviously be removed and then relocated and reconstructed back, which ends up being approximately 200 of gross feet. Uh, it's approximately 180. I added an additional buffer just to be safe of making it roughly 200 square feet. We also then looked at the services that existed within that space itself. And what you'll notice is specifically on the left-hand portion, we have, excuse me, the condensing unit, the main electrical uh, panels, 
And there is a hose bib, which you cannot see, it's right under here, but there is a hose bib uh, location right there. The interior lights and a few of the items that are uh, fixtures, they're here, this GFCI plug as well. But the other main, sh the main uh, infrastructure items for the house, the HVAC units, the uh, water intake and water heater system, those are all well within the scope of where you would need to be modifying to meet the code, so those would not need to be touched. What you would need to do is relocate portions of this. However, given their location and given the location of the house and the way it is run, most likely these branch circuits, either running this way or running this way, have adequate length to satisfy a relocation here. The interior uh, wiring from meter to panel can be maintained, so you would just basically have to pull it, relocate the panels, put it back in, and the cost associated then with this is not just the cost of relocation, but uh, I believe it's underground utility lines, they would have to be extended over, which the utility company can provide. Uh, additionally, you may need additional um, condensing unit lines, but that's a minimal cost for the HVAC because you are not actually modifying any of your branch ducting or any of the register um, locations. So it would just be relocating the panel, the electrical, and then those condensing lines to the unit itself. So um, council also brought the fact that I did not take into account roofing modifications, and that is not the case. Uh, so this is the, sh the roof plan um, to get an understanding of how the roof was laid out, and it's a double hip that comes out to the front of the property. I then looked at the structural framing of that through the trust plan that was submitted with the uh, plan. Again, this is from all from the permitted set. Again, the reason to believe that it's not constructed in accordance with this. And noticing that the clear spans of the units back to here where the roof hip framing starts can be removed back to this portion and then either field reconstructed for a portion of them or site reconstructed depending on the structural needs or the roof finish. The easiest solution to this, in my opinion, if you were looking at it, would be to remove back to a portion and then rebuild one truss forward, um, utilizing uh, bar drafters and a drop truss to provide a gable framing at the end. Um, it would not be 100% consistent with the um, adjacent roof lines if we're looking to the right side of the building. However, it is a solution that is totally applicable and does not have to be very cost prohibitive of redoing new truss work all the way back. It also saves on the amount of roofing that needs to be removed and then reconstructed back as you would only need to remove back a certain portion to get access to that truss and then the barge, the barge rafters and overbuild over into and beyond the uh, new exterior wall. Or the applicant re could request a de minimis variance at that point. Not saying well, it would be granted, we'll, but they could. We will get to that. Okay. Um, so then we also looked at the bath itself um, because obviously there's another protrusion which goes into the front yard setback. And based off of the 2020 Florida Building Code Residential Edition, 7th edition from Part 3, Chapter 3, Section R3.07.1, Figure R3.07.1, which specifies main clear dimensions necessary for bath construction for residential units. And we see that there's a 30 inch minimum dimension that's ne necessary for shower stalls. Um, there's a approximately 40 plus or minus uh, going off of some of the materiality in the drawing. There were not specific call outs for material finishes, but assuming that it is um, cement board and then tiling allowances were for that along with the CMU and wall framing were added along with the sheeting and then adding an additional uh, dimension of about a half inch just for some play to give you a rough estimate of how much that would be. Obviously it's over 10 inches. Uh, there's also a shadow box which goes to further show the minimum dimension on A2 of the permit set which specifies quote finished interior dimension of the shower to be minimum 30 inches per code. We also looked at the allowable projections and encroachments into setback. This is per City of Cape Coral Land Development Code, Volume 2, Article 4, Chapter 1, Section 4.1.5, Table 4.1.5, titled Permitted Setback Encroachments. 
Here we see we have two distinct things that we're going to highlight. One is architectural features, and the other one is eaves, gutters, and overhangs. So architectural features, according to the table, may project and encroach into the front yard a maximum of two feet, while eaves, gutters, and overhangs may encroach into the front yard a maximum of three feet. So the definition of architectural features per the City of Cape Coral Land Development Code, this is found in Volume 2, Article 11, Chapter 1, Section 11.2, under architectural feature, an architectural feature is, quote, any prominent or characteristic part of a building, including windows, columns, awning, marquee, facade, or fascia. So what does that, all of that mean in relation to the construction of this portion of the building? Well, one, roof modifications are not necessary to this portion of the dwelling, as the roof eave is permissible within the front yard set back to a depth of three feet. The roof eave noted on, is noted as projecting one foot four inches from the exterior face of CMU, if we take that, the wall is dimensioned as projecting into the setback 0.6 feet, which is roughly seven and a quarter. Assuming eight inch, just again, give us that bit of play, plus the 1.4, or one foot four, what we end was a max projection of two feet into the setback. Obviously, that two foot is less than the three foot allowable, which is permissible by code, so the roof modifications at this location would not be necessary. Again, to speak to the Overbuild sections on the other portion of the roof, they would be permissible to build those barge rafters out to an extent of three feet. Obviously, you're not going to build out that far. If you're doing barge rafters, uh, you most likely want to do somewhere in the vicinity of eight to 12 inches um, just for additional structure. You could go farther, but it would require some additional framing um, and tie-ins for structural stability given longer, longer projections. Not infeasible, but possible. So they would not need to seek a variance for the eave projections and rake projections if they were to do something of a gable or if they wanted to take the roof back to a hip design um, and modify farther back into the roof, it would be permissible without the variance requirement for that eave into the front yard setback. So again, architectural features as defined by the LDC, when we look at that, typically con constitute items of both structural and non-structural in nature that exist outside the building envelope. Modifications to the envelope walls may be undertaken as a possible solution which would allow for compliance with the required setback at a reduced cost. The fixed window that we see in this location could be reutilized and relocated back into the new envelope wall, which would be now a new non-bearing wall, and the existing front wall could be maintained with an opening there with the wall presented back, which you'll see in a minute. Um, it also does not have to be eight inch CMU. It can range anywhere from four to eight inches deep depending on the material wishing to be constructed of. You could use a four inch CMU. You could use a uh, two by six uh, pressure treated furring wall. Any of these solutions would be applicable. So in looking at it, we have the ability here with the existing um, maintenance where the, the wet wall and the drain do not have to be relocated. Obviously you would need to rework the shower pan a little bit to accommodate for the new wall and the new slopes. You could maintain that 30 inch clear and assuming with this model that we're using an eight inch CMU, with the infill of the envelope and the wall system, you would be able to tie back and the two remaining architectural features, projections now could be maintained as those architectural features without necessary modifications and still meeting the requirements of the land development code for permissible projections within the front yard setback as they would not be projecting more than the eight inches plus the six, which would take you under the two, uh, under the two feet requirements at about a foot, a foot four. Um, so, and you can see that called out in here, you would basically remove under the window, be able to maintain the lintel uh, and the header, not have to redo the truss work, um, and then provide new finishes. Um, it could be a feature wall, you could do many things with it, but there's po one possible solution. So then in looking at the numbers based off of this new evidence that staff had determined in doing their due diligence to determine the numbers, we see that nest, uh, separate garage construction is not necessary to meet the garage requirements of the land development code. Given that it's not necessary to construct that uh, separate garage to meet the requirements of the land development code, those costs are not necessarily ones that are needed for the uh, project in order for it to meet code. What we do want to look at is the demolitions, for the demolition and reconstruction numbers provided, and the total base cost, obviously those will modify taking out specific elements 
that aren't pertinent to the new construction, which is now not necessary for the development to meet code and for the variance not to necessarily be needed in order to have a fully compliant permitted house. So we begin with the design fees, uh, assuming principal and architect review, um, roughly 150 to 200 an hour. Uh, draftsmen, typically $100 per hour. What you'll see is obviously the draftsmen will take up most of the time because their time is less valuable from a money standpoint. I'm not gonna say less valuable from an actual value standpoint, being a draftsman for many years through college. Um, what we find is a breakdown of roughly four hours for principal and architect work, structural analysis, things like that, project review, drawing review, and about 26 hours of draftsmen for about a 30 hour total for the revision cost of the drawing sets. Figuring in four hours at the maximum height range of that $200 per hour, we get 800, and 26 hours for the draftsmen, figuring in that $100, which again is at the higher range, and all these numbers come from the American Institute of Architects contract generations. Um, what we find is a roughly $3,400 cost. Uh, obviously, we add in profit and overhead for that because you're gonna want to assume that that's part of the getting paid and why you're doing the work. So we take that 3,400 and we add a quarter or 25%, which is fairly high in overhead, but not something that's not uncommon for architectural and engineer professions, which gets us an additional 850, which gives us a revision cost of approximately $425, 4,000, excuse me, $250. For the design fee, we're gonna round that up to 4,500 just for ease of uh, calculation and to add in some additional buffer. We then looked at selective demolition, and this is where the staff utilized the 2023 National Building Cost Manual. It is expensive, but you can get them a little cheaper. Um, I just happened to have a copy of them. Um, and while they did reside at my house, I had my brother send me pictures of the pages um, specifically to do these um, requirements. So the cost estimates for this range, uh, selective demolition range from anywhere from eight feet to $30 for residential, and that's uh, dependent upon a great many of factors, complexity of construction, scope of demolition, retention, all of those things add into the cost that's going to be associated. Obviously, if you're just taking a sledge to a wall and don't care about what's inside that wall or what you're trying to save, the cost associated with it's gonna be less. If you have to saw cut, do selective demo, try to maintain items, the cost is gonna be more. But assuming the $30 per square foot of the maximum upper range, just again for um, that highest and best estimate, what we found was there's approximately 140 square feet of the new garage space for modification. And that's about half of the total garage area, not counting the second portion, which wraps around down into the uh, south portion of the garage. Uh, we also looked at the 200 square feet of existing garage, which would need to be completely removed. The 50 square feet of the bathroom space, again, that's counting the entirety of the bathroom, figuring in things like the tile work, the shower pan, the walls, um, which gave us about 390 square feet. Again, bump that up to 400 just to be safe. Multiplying that out, what we found was $12,000 for selective demolition. We added a 10% cushion for that just, again, to be safe as if things pop up in the field, may not be necessarily uh, accounted for, but you want that additional cushion. So what we found was a, a selective demolition cost of approximately $13,200 or $13,500 after we added an additional cushion and to make it, again, an easier number to deal with. Uh, we then utilized the National Building Cost Manual, looking at quality class five, which is average construction, again, the house itself, there's no, nothing particularly um, deviation or devi, I don't wanna say deviant, but uh, that deviates from the uh, typical construction and the average construction that we see throughout the city of Cape Coral um, for design and construction methodology. So you define, you what, I'm sorry, what is PPSF? Oh, um, that's the price per square foot. I was gonna get to that in the next. Okay, thank you. No problem. So what we find is for quality class five and the smallest square footage, which is 700 square feet, because the less amount of square footage you have, the higher the PPSF or price per square foot is going to be because it's going to be premium work. Obviously, you can spread costs out the more area you have for work, even though that seems a little counterintuitive. Uh, what we found was that there is a price per square foot 
of $148.33. Now, there is allowances in the manual for region adjustment, and the entirety of the 2023 National Building Cost Manual is utilizing metropolitan numbers. Uh, and specifically because metropolitan areas see the highest in terms of cost of construction. Uh, obviously, there are unions, materials, other additional costs that are associated with it for operating within those metropolitan areas. So they provide a chart of prospective cities within the state as well as state allowances as well for reductions off of that. So what we found was uh, in the Florida average, there's about a 3% reduction in the PPSF or the price per square foot necessary for Florida construction. What we found from a city breakdown that they have is that Fort Myers is approximately negative 5%, Naples is negative 2, and Bradenton is negative 5. But these are pre-hurricane numbers, I would assume, because I'm assuming that the, uh, the manual was uh, probably put together in 2022 or 2021, yeah, all the bits and pieces of publishing it, and probably was was done pre-hurricane. So I, mm -hmm. I would uh, I would be concerned about that Fort Myers negative five. Well, that is addressed, and I'll address it in a uh, little bit Go when ahead. we move on to the actual right. cost. Um, so we did want to utilize that national adjustment uh, for the local area, but we utilized the state average instead of the lower average of negative five for Fort Myers, just again to have some a little bit. Uh, cushion built into it. So within these costs are included items that are not particular to the scope of the requested or the scope of the necessary redevelopment of the buildings. For instance, kitchen allowances are provided. There's no modifications to kitchens. Complete plumbing systems, complete HVAC systems, et cetera. There are things in there that are counted in that price per square foot that are not necessary to the redevelopment of select portions of the building. So in looking at that, what we came with was a PPSF that's adjusted 35%, removing specific items. And what we found were allowances of windows and doors, minus 5%, which we can re reutilize the existing windows and garage doors for the construction. Kitchen allowances obviously are not necessary. Special features, while it actually operates a much larger, there are no other special features outside of the electrical systems which we have in there. Uh, and then just general allowances and interior detail. So what we roughly found is that by taking into account, we got down to a price per square foot of approximately $94.25. $94 we adjusted that up to $95 just to give us some cushion and to make it a little bit easier for estimate's sake. So figuring that, we went through the cost associated with the 400 square foot in total that we have researched previously. And we, we came to a reconstruction cost of approximately $38,000. Now we added 10% again for that cushion um, and came to a reconstruction cost of 41,800, rounded that up to 42. What we saw for total cost for alterations when we take these numbers in, comp in combination is $4,500, excuse me, $60,000 including the design fee, selective demo, and reconstruction. Now these are including sub-profit and loss. Those are automatically calculated into those because they're based off of trade work, which we'll see talked about a little bit here. So what we have is the total estimated staff cost of 60,000. Now there's an estimated cost of, that the applicant provided us of $69,400. It's within 15.6%. Staff has no objections to that. Obviously the gentleman is a developer here, he may have specific subs, there may be materiality due to the hurricane that he is not able to receive in a timely manner. Um, so there could be causes for that higher number. Staff wouldn't dispute that and thinks that that was a fair number, given that it's within the 20%, that's the maximum range that we like to see for estimates. However, the additional item is that there's a subline in there for adding 15% for sub profit. Now, in going back and looking at this, obviously, there is a lot of work here, but the property owner is a developer himself who constructed the property. And in looking at the permit the, for the property, it was noted that there are only three subs that were utilized on this. Um, and we have them here for roofing, plumbing, and electrical. Now, obviously, all the other work was done within or 
as part of the development without the inclusion of specific subs. But regardless of that, the sub work needs to be actually traded out in the trade itself because you are adding that percentage of work to the trade work and not to the overall cost. So when you're adding 15% to the overall cost, you're adding costs to items that are not necessarily going to be utilizing trades, so that is just a baked in number. What you want are you want to utilize those specific trades because if a HVAC contractor is gonna charge you $5,000, obviously 15% of $5,000 is a lot less than 15% of $80,000. It's, it's sort of like tipping on the uh, total uh, restaurant bill instead of tipping on the uh, price before the tax. Uh, that's a pretty good analogy, yes, ma'am. Um, and so what we what we found is that staff was okay with their assertion of the 69,400 and accepts that within the cost parameters that they've accept that they've provided themselves that the uh, cost of 70,000 is a realistic cost for the redevelopment of the the re demolition and reconstruction relocation of items within the project to meet code. So if we go back to the very beginning of the presentation for LDC 3.4.3.B.4, you'll recall that staff specified that cost of partial demolition and reconstructing or alternate design and construction solutions may be practical, which we have demonstrated there are practical solutions, and reduce the cost burden below the level of hardship. Obviously, the cost, while there is a cost associated with it, and there's a cost associated with every mistake we make, um, regardless of what the mistake is, that the cost itself is a lot less than the complete demolition and reconstruction of the property in order to meet code. So again, there exist potential solutions which do not deprive the applicant of rights that are commonly enjoyed by other properties and which may, make, may not be unique or may not be undue hardships on the applicant. And with this, I do want to note a couple of items. Um, counselor specified that the two-car garage is a, I, I don't wanna say a necessity, but that within the area, there are no two car, there are no one-car garages. That is not true. Within the area, just the, just the area of this property within the neighborhood, I have indicated and located six houses that have one car garages and I can read those into the record right now at property ad addresses at 135 Southwest 29th Terrace, 3005 Southwest 2nd Place, 317 Southwest 31st Street, 2946 Southwest 3rd Place, 334 Southwest 28th Terrace, and 2935 Southwest 1st Place. Now those are just within the location and neighborhood of this property that is not within the city as a whole. And having dealt with building permits throughout the city, uh, even in the limited capacity, I can tell you there are houses that we have approved with one car garages, and there are call calls we field from uh, prospective applicants that wish to build no garages whatsoever. Um, however, since the city has a requirement for a minimum, the garage is necessary and they must comply with that requirement. Sometimes they don't like it and they don't build here. Sometimes they'll bite the bullet and build it, but that is the requirement. The city does allow every property owner by right to build the domicile as long as it's com compliant with the, building, with the Florida building codes and with our local land development codes and which includes a garage of minimum size, which is the 14 by 20. Again, we do not specify orientation. To further compound this, I would like to highlight from the material that was submitted by the applicant, specifically uh, both of the articles um, from J.D. Power and the other one is from, I never pronounced their, their name right, Howes, I think, it, I think is how it's specified. <laughs> I can never pronounce it right. Um, what we see when we get into the, the association of a two car versus a one car versus a three car versus a four car garage is choice. Um, and not specifically requirements uh, from the, the municipality or from national standards. Um, what that is to say is every homeowner has the ability to build a garage that they choose in a size that they choose, so long as it is comp uh, compliant with the minimum requirements and so long as there is the compliance with the 
requirements of the rest of the codes, uh, structural items, setback items, and things like that. And what we see is that in the JD Power article, we do not have to go any farther than the, uh, I'm assuming, fourth sentence because the couple sentences are highlighted, and I can pull it up here because we do have access to the article. So this is within the article, how many square feet is an A2 garage? And what we see here is at this bottom right here, quote, these reasons should compel you to carefully consider just what kind of garage you want. And if your choice stops at a two car one, we can certainly give you good advice. Um, obviously, again, that highlights the fact that the Selection of the size of the garage is a choice determined by the applicant or by a property owner when they're looking at developing out their house. Now, the property owner had chose to build a three-car garage that was compliant with all the codes, but unfortunately, due to the mistakes that happened in the field, that three-car garage was constructed in such a way that makes it non-compliant. If the applicant wishes to maintain specific sizing for that, um, he has other options that would allow him to still be compliant, such as building a detached garage or building a shed or obtaining a storage unit. There are a multitude of ways in which additional storage may be granted, but the fact of that a necessary amount of space is required for the garage, the code only requires a 14 by 20 minimum. Anything over that is the applicant's choice on what they can want to construct. Additionally, if we go into the article, we see if we scroll down into the second page here, this type of garage, and quoting again from the article, this type of garage is common in the US suburban areas and can easily be considered a popular pick. Again, coming down to choice and not a requirement. We can then also go into the house article. Again, I, I never can say that right. Um, in which, we'll pull up the article itself. The very first sentence, let me scroll down here. Oop, yep. Did not go down far enough, there it is. So throughout the past century, garage dimensions have remained about nine to 10 feet wide and about 80, 18 to 20 feet long per car with a single garage door with, of eight feet. Obviously those are inside the requirements that the city code has provided and those are what has been maintained. The, if we also look within the article itself, we will note that there is a section specific to zoning regulations and requirements. See if I could, if I went down enough. So here we see where it specifies, quote, many zoning and building codes have minimum dimensions for garages. So be certain you know those when planning your design. Local building codes can also address door hardware, protection of mechanical systems, a form of cars, and garage door openers. So consult a design professional to be sure you are covered in these issues. This highlights the fact that it acknowledges that there are zoning requirements that are necessary for implementation of garages, but again, does not specify that check your local zoning code to make sure two car garage is permissible because that's the requirement. Nowhere in this article or in either of these articles does it specify that a two car garage is the necessary minimum for a house. In fact, I have developed and designed houses in which there are no garages necessary uh, or constructed at all. Um, this highlights again the fact that there is no denial of any property rights. The property owner with the posited solution, again, this is just one solution that I have come up with in looking at the possibility of creating a code compliance structure with the zoning code. There, are many talented architects out there and designers which are much brighter than me when it comes to a strategic design and thinking which um, could de develop solutions that are both breathtaking and cost effective. 
Um, but what the allowance I have showed is that there are positive solutions which do not deny the property owner the right to have his garage, which meets a minimum requirement, have the property be compliant with all setback codes, and maintain the life, health, and safety of the area. So there was a question brought up about the site distance triangles of the posited uh, side yard discharge for the parking lot. And if we go back to the aerial, there we go, and we will zoom in. It's a little hard to see, I apologize. Oh, no, I went too far that time. All right. What you'll notice is that the car house, I'm sorry, the house directly across the street, which discharges almost at the exact same location that this property could discharge at, has a driveway which discharges onto Southwest Third Street, the same way that this drive could also do. Um, obviously, the site distance requirements, as outlined in our engineering design standards, would be maintained. Uh, as this drive, if we're looking at it, would be relatively in line with the uh, drive that is across the street. Again, we only require certain setbacks for driveways of, on local roadways, which I believe is 25 or 20 feet off of the uh, subject property line. Uh, I believe it's 25. I'm not 100% sure as I don't have the manual with me right now. But regardless, the setback itself would be farther than that, given the way in which the minimum requirement is 25 feet. Uh, and then you would obviously, the garage door is smaller than the overall 20 foot space. Uh, if you were utilizing a 16 foot, you'd want a, uh, a drive that's roughly the si same size as your garage door. Or if you wanted to include uh, provisions for additional side parking, you could have a pad that came off to the south. So all this is, is to say that the staff reaffirms, oops, Uh, we'll do this. Is that staff would reaffirm its recommendation for this specific section that the standard is not met by the applicant. Um, provided that two of these standards were not met, the conclusion is still the same from the conclusion and recommendation are still the same from staff that the project be denied because it does not specifically meet all seven sections of the code for consideration of approval. Um, staff, again, would love to be able to be up here and champion the approval of the project. We feel for the applicant. We understand mistakes happen. Um, however, the code is very clear in its requirements and what it specifies. And because they did not meet those two specific criteria, we cannot recommend approval at this time. Um, we did receive one call from a property owner. They just wanted more information. They did not know what property this was or how it affected their property. After speaking with that property owner, making him aware of what the variance request was, he thanked me and uh, that was the end of the conversation. He did not wish to either support or oppose the variance and no other correspondence has been received um, to date prior to the hearing. So with that, I will stand by for any questions. I have no questions, thank you. This is a public hearing. Are there members of the public who wish to provide input or testimony? Seeing none, um, I will bring it back to the applicant. And um, did you have further testimony? Yeah, I'm gonna wrap it up. But um, hopefully before my computer dies. So I'd first like to note here that the burden of proof in this hearing, it's a quasi-judicial hearing, so of course the burden of proof is competent substantial evidence. Um, I, I appreciate the detail that staff went into with regard to the possible plans that could be done here, uh, but I found the presentation today to be illustrative. Um, much of the planning that staff had put together to demonstrate that there is no hardship is based off of assumptions. 
They don't have the exact measurements for everything that has been installed. They don't know exactly what widths and dimensions are in there, exactly where the lines run. So um, it's impossible for staff to really come in and say, yes, you can do that. I would argue that they haven't met the burden of proof to rebut entitlement to the variance. Um, I'll also note that staff mentioned a new driveway would, um, I don't know if they're saying that should be a requirement or if it would be suggested, but I did not see a cost estimate associated with a driveway. So we can add that into the mix, whatever a driveway costs. Um, so, and again, I'll also note, I think it's really important here that we clarify the property owner is not a developer. Property owner is a contractor. He's a home builder. He comes in, he doesn't go out and seek entitlements like this. I'm not sure that he's ever done this before. I can't say for sure he's not here. Um, but he is not going out and getting zoning and DO approvals and doing all of that. He comes into a site that's already entitled. He comes in, he builds a house based on the permits that he is able to get approved. And that's what he tried to do here. He did it to the best of his ability. There was an error. We're also not going to dispute the minimum requirement for garages. We understand that there are minimum dimensional requirements. I think an important point to make here is that those requirements speak more to the people that don't want to put a garage in, often developers, often the people that I'm usually up here representing, quite frankly. They want to do the bare minimum. They make it cheaper. Um, maybe there's a, you know, kind of trend at the moment. I'm not sure I can admit this testimony because you're talking about people that... Right. You're right. I you're think, right. I think we're a little bit off point here. So the point here is that the minimum requirements for garages are not at issue here. We're not disputing that. What we're saying is that every home, genuinely, every home that I have looked at in R1 zoning has had a two-car garage. I never stated that my search was encompass the entire city, the entire R1 zoning district. And I can see that staff found six houses that did have one car garages. But again, like he said, that was by choice. Um, here, the intention is not to have a one car garage. It's not appropriate. And I will get into some measurements actually about that because I was sort of curious. And my car, for context, is almost 18 feet long. So it could fit into a 20 foot deep garage, no problem, from a length perspective. My car is a standard size SUV. They make multiple different makes and models with the same body style, same measurements. My car is seven feet wide. The doors are about three feet wide each. So for someone like me, if I'm riding around and I have my husband or Kelsey. This really isn't about your personal choices. No, I understand that, but these, this is a very common car. These are the dimensions for a Tahoe, for a Suburban, for a GMC Yukon, for a Cadillac Escalade. Um, obviously, there are extended widths that will change that, but th this is a standard car. You see them all over the road. This would be the same, uh, very similar for many pickup trucks, share the same dimensions. It's very hard to get in and out of a car of that size in a garage that is 14 by 20 feet. You would end up parking in your driveway more often than not, which maybe that's not a hardship, but for somebody who set, maybe has a commercial vehicle, for somebody who has a boat trailer, for things like that, you really start to get into a place where you risk violating ordinances and therefore you have to go out and you have to go buy a different storage slip somewhere for your trailer that you wouldn't have needed otherwise. A two-car garage, as we have seen, is the standard. It is not the minimum required, but it is a right that many other properties in the R1 district have, and it's one that I, we are I'm seeking sure to maintain. I'm not sure I would characterize it as a right. I would characterize it as an option, but, but keep going. Okay. I will also note that Generally, when we are looking at requirements, we are expected to read whatever those requirements are in pari materia, start to finish, to really understand the context and how to interpret them. 
It is my understanding based on staff's testimony that he didn't use the entire manual when putting together his cost estimates. So I would ask that that is struck from the record. Um, my next point, staff did clarify that the revised roof line as uh, they proposed in their presentation would not be entirely cohesive with the existing roof line. And quite frankly, the only real practical concern I have heard here today, Madam Hearing Examiner, was from you that you thought that the, the building where it sits now looks odd. I have not heard any other real issue in practice with this other than it just doesn't adhere to the code. So the house subjectively looks odd now. But then if we have a roof line that doesn't match the rest of the house, that's gonna look really odd. So no matter what we do here, it's going to look strange. Again, we have not seen any real issue that would affect the public health or safety or general welfare otherwise. And again, there has been discussion today about the impacts of, you know, what would happen if this variance were to get approved, does that open the floodgates? Does it create some sort of slippery slope situation where now other people can come in and say, oops, I have a surveyor error and we need a variance? If that is a, a real concern, and I understand that it is valid, but if it is something that the city really feels should be addressed, they can absolutely do that. They can update their code to require a foundation survey. Um, if they do that, I. I don't know that there would be a whole lot of issue. I think it would be great because it would avoid this type of issue going forward and it would mitigate risk. I can see where maybe it could add cost and time and people wouldn't like it, but there is a valid public purpose. It would be within the city's police power to do that, but it's not in place right now. And we're working with the code as it sits today and there is a hardship. So coming back to that, I'm gonna come back to the first condition, which is circumstances or conditions that are unique to the, pro to the land, building, or structure involved. Here, there are circumstances, if not conditions, that are unique to this property. The circumstances of how this was built, there was an error, it won't happen again. Why would not the surveyor be responsible for the, for the additional cost? You said there's a, there is a, uh, Hardship to the applicant. You've clearly said uh, that there's an error that was made by the surveyor. Why wouldn't the surveyor be responsible for the, for the uh, whatever the cost of fixing the problem would be, and therefore the applicant would not be disadvantaged? So from a cost perspective, that's more of a civil matter, and I won't address that here. Admittedly, that's not my practice area. Um, that's not what I'm saying, and I'm, I'm not suggesting it should be a civil lawsuit, and I'm not saying that this... Uh, that this is uh, addressing anything that would happen in civil court. Um, what I am saying is that you're saying that the applicant would have a hardship in incurring these costs. And what I'm saying is why would the applicant have that? You, you clearly delineated that the, uh, that the surveyor made an error. Why would it not be the surveyor's problem and therefore not the applicant's problem to, if, if there were a corrective measure necessary? I'm not understanding what you're saying here even if the corrective measure proposed by staff were feasible here, it's still a hardship. It's still a very small garage. It doesn't provide adequate space for many cars on the road. It does not provide um, the type of storage that would be typical in this area. It would deprive this particular property owner and all future property owners of the ability to have that additional parking spot. You can't park in your grass. You can't park a trailer, like a boat trailer or a boat on your property at all, except outside of your garage. You can't park a commercial vehicle on your property except inside of your garage. If you have a car that's maybe out of service, you can't park it except in your garage. There's really strict parking requirements here. So to take away a parking space is really a hardship. And it's one that is different from all of these other houses in the zoning district. Now, maybe the people who came in with those, the six houses with the one car garages, maybe, maybe it's a single person. I don't, I don't know what happened there, but the majority of houses, the great majority of them have a standard parking, have a standard garage for two cars. But your client has the ability to have the tax, the tax garage as, as a matter of fact, the tax 
Now I'm sorry to have a problem with that. <laughs> so it's a, it's a detached. There we go. Garage. So, oh, let me finish. Let me finish. My turn. And um, and your client actually provided a cost estimate for that, I believe, for that very scenario. And why would that cost not be passed along to the surveyor uh, who committed the error? And it would not be a cost to the applicant whatsoever. Again, I think we're getting more into civil matters. Um, but, uh, but the question is who would, who would bear the hardship? And the code clearly says the applicant, one of the criterion is the applicant would have a hardship. What I'm saying, maybe the applicant wouldn't have a hardship. Maybe a third party might have a hardship, but then that's the third party that was responsible for the error to begin with. But anyway, can we, uh, can we kind of uh, wrap up? Yeah, I think yeah. we're getting redundant at this point. Right. So I had a response to that, and I just lost it. Um, my apologies. Ultimately here, we have unique circumstances to this property that are unlike the other properties in the area, and we have a hardship regardless of cost. Oh, I'm coming back to the threshold for cost. The only reason we're getting this deep into the cost measurement is because in the staff report, they state that moving a house is estimated to be around $150,000 and therefore is a hardship. So if that is the threshold, if somewhere around $150,000 is a threshold for a hardship, we're showing that, hey, well, it's gonna cost $182,000 to do the detached garage. Well, and I have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with, with the document. I have a problem with there's no one here to testify and no one here that, uh, that can uh, be asked questions on line items. And so I, I, uh, I appreciate that you've taken some extra steps of providing additional information, but I'm not sure the value of that unless there's someone here that can authenticate uh, where those numbers came from. I mean, uh, staff um, is testifying as to his own work, therefore it's not hearsay. And, uh, and I know that the hearsay rules are relaxed when we come to quasi-judicial, uh, I, I actually assisted in writing that, that <laughs> material, so I, I'm, I'm very conversant with it, but this is a, a very material point. And uh, so that is a concern. I will, I will tell you a second concern I have while, while, I'm, while I, I've stopped you. Um, I don't have from the applicant um, a legal description. Uh, let us hypothesize that, that, um, that I were to grant the variance. Not saying I would, not saying I wouldn't. I'm, I'm not not gone down that road yet. Um, I, don't have, uh, I don't have a legal description of, of the property with the as-built. Um, I'm assuming this document is the as-built, but I don't, I don't know that. And I don't have any list of conditions proposed by the applicant for, uh, for uh, the variance, which would be critical uh, for me to consider. Now, it's not staff's job to do that because staff is recommending denial. Normally, if staff represent, uh, uh, recommends approval, staff would come forward with conditions. But in every variance, there's, there's, there are conditions, there are as-built, uh, there's normally a survey, and there's a legal description. I don't have any of that, and that's a problem. So I will note, just as a little background on this, when we submitted the application, actually none of the planning and zoning applications were technically open. The city still had them temporarily closed to deal with the aftermath of the storm. And in speaking with a different staff person, he agreed that we could apply for this because it was urgent. There were some real needs. As you may remember from the last hearing, the property owner has a construction loan that is in limbo because the construction is complete, but yet he can't get a real more, like a true homeowner's policy on this house because there's no CO. The other issue here is that because we are having this issue and there's no CO, the house is uninsurable. There is no... I, I'm not sure you're addressing the points that I just Right, raised. and so I'm, so, right. So coming back to this, I submitted the application materials. And after a couple of weeks, I checked in with staff just to say, hey, what's going on? You know, when should I see an insufficiency letter? I don't, you know was basically met with not a lot of information. And I called many times in between submitting the application and receiving the staff report recommending denial to discuss these issues. I was told that there was 
no insufficiency, and therefore we would not need to have a round of insufficiency, that the application was complete, that we met all requirements, and that they just were recommending denial. So as far as the additional documents, I do apologize that you don't have them. If you would like to leave the record open in a limited capacity for a limited amount of time, I'm happy to obtain those documents for you. Well, that's not something that we do is the problem. We don't, we don't allow documents after the fact. Your Honor, and then staff wouldn't have the opportunity to respond to those documents. John and Clary is to the attorney's office. You know, staff, if, if this was a path you were going down, staff would need to be able to review these documents and, and respond. Right and I don't, uh, we would strongly recommend against another continuance. <laughs> against another what? Continuance. I, and I'm not suggesting that. Well, wait. Wait, what you're saying, I think what you're saying is you would object to keeping the record open for submission of documents outside the records. You're not objecting Absolutely. to nothing. The staff would not, have the staff would not have the opportunity to respond, and we do not see any reason to come back here and discuss this matter once again. Well, thank you. I, I, uh, I concur with your concerns about having documents submitted outside the record. Um, as to the continuance, I'm, I, I'm not ready to go down that road. So, um, the, the, so uh, let, let me ask you a question. What did you think, if the variance were granted, what did you think the parameters would look like? I, I'm not understanding why you wouldn't understand that conditions and legal descriptions in a, in a survey would be required. We just, I, I, and I'm not trying to be facetious, but we just say, yep, the variance is okay without delineating what that variance would consist of? The variance would simply legitimize what exists there now. We would. I, that's not what we do. We, we, we have parameters of, of what exactly are the dimensions of the variance and what are the conditions under which the variance would continue. And those are, those are mandatory um, attachments to an order. Once again, I'm not saying that, that I would grant the order, grant the request, but we don't just say, yep, it's okay, but we're not going to delineate what, what, what that consists of. No, and I, I would not suggest that. I would not ever want any possible approval of the variance to permit any further encroachment into the front setback or into any other setback where it doesn't already exist. I, have not, I don't have the tools to work with here, is what I'm saying. I can provide the dimensions. Um, but we can't do that outside of public hearing because once again, staff, as, as the Assistant City Attorney indicated, staff has, uh, has the ability to comment on proposed conditions and also to look at the proposed uh, legal description and, uh, and the uh, drawing, the sketch, whatever we're gonna call it. It would be my position, it's my position here, that we have submitted everything that is required by the code. We are more than happy to submit this additional information, but our, this was not, we, we submitted what we needed to submit under the code for the request for variance. We did not get an insufficiency response staff found our initial submittal to be sufficient. If they had come back and said, we need a legal description for the areas that will be encroaching into the front setback in an insufficiency letter, we would have given it to them. If they had asked for it at the last hearing or any time before now, I can guarantee you that we would have gotten it to you as quickly as possible. Well, I don't really think it's staff's job to do that. Your Honor, and staff wouldn't ask for that information because staff was recommending denial in this instance. So there there was no request for any additional documents and drawings. Correct, and, and, and I, I, I'm trying to be respectful, but I think this would be something that um, the council would normally understand and without having to have the city tell you. It's unusual. It's, in it's 101 in, in the city of Cape Coral. Meaning, meaning, you understand what I'm saying by 101? Yeah, <laughs> yes, of course. But, you know, not, our land use team does not just practice here in Cape Coral. We practice in other jurisdictions. So 
if it's not written in the code, if it's not a requirement, and if it's not something that we have already been informed that we should have, that it's a best practice, which we were not here, then we would have no reason to believe that this would have been required. But your firm's been here before and, and has been here before on variance, on at least one variance that I can recall. So I, I, I don't want to belabor the point. I, I don't have the materials. Um, even if, if I were inclined to grant what you're asking for, I don't have the materials that I would need to, uh, to incorporate into that order. I, I just don't have it. Um, I, and I, 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 we don't accept submissions after the fact because that would be out of the public, uh, public view, uh, purview and that would actually be a violation of, of uh, a pretty serious violation of the rules here. So I, I, I can't do that. So. Um, I believe the language could be crafted. I mean, we provided an as-built, and I do believe that the language could be crafted such that the structure would have to conform with what is represented in the as-built. Any legal description that would further describe what is shown in the as-built is very objective. Um, very objective. I would have no problem providing it to. <laughs> but we, we don't. We don't. We don't accept documents after the fact. So, so your options are to request another continuance, which I've already had the assistant city attorney opine on, um, or um, or by taking it from there with what I've just advised you. I, I'm not accepting uh, materials out of the public record. I would request a continuance then, um, so that we could reconvene with the requested documents and to confirm that would be a legal description of the encroachment in as built and conditions conditions and uh, and potentially testimony um, on the uh, on the potential uh, on the estimated cost from your perspective uh, but I would like to have staff opine on whether or not um, we are you your opinion about the continuance well if I your honor if I may first and then sure. mr. Okay. Santor um, Per 3.4.3 of the code under variances, um, the hearing examiner must find, before we can get into a continuance, the hearing examiner must find that the application meets all of the criteria, B, one through seven. You know, obviously there's a differing opinion on points one and four. Um, council has some pretty good arguments. I, unusual arguments on number one. I'm not sure that that's the intent of that section. Not, not interested in, in evaluation of the evidence. No, uh, absolutely, no absolutely. But I, in my opinion, as staff indicated, the applicant can't meet B4. It's a two-pronged test. Staff has gone back and forth that possibly there's a hardship. But before you get into whether there's a hardship, the literal interpretation of the code would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the zone district. This, this property owner is not being deprived of any rights to build a single family home on his property. He could build a single family home on his property, he or she. Um, there is no right to a two car garage. It's an option, as everyone talked, uh, talked about. There are several homes that have single car garages. Some have two, some have three. It's an option of a property owner. But I, I don't see how, um, this property owner can't build a home there. And then as for, there was another um, issue raised about possible condemnation action. And in, in my opinion, if this variance is not granted today, the city will not have any exposure liability for condemnation for a denial of a variance in, of this type. I appreciate your perspective. Are you going to opine on the continuance? We would object to a continuance only because, in my opinion, this is delaying the inevitable. Um, the hearing examiner must find that all seven of these criteria are met, and I do not believe the hearing examiner could find that this property owner is being depri deprived of any rights. I appreciate your perspective. And we would strongly recommend against a... <clears throat> Duly noted. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Santora, how would Madam you hearing like to... Madam Hearing Examiner, uh, Anthony Santora, Associate Planner and Planning Division. Uh, my understanding is that the Applicant is allowable one continuance uh, for the case, and such, as such, the applicant has already utilized that continuance 
uh, very early on within the case. The continuance was mine. Uh, no, there was a continuance prior to yours in which the applicant requested a continuance because the property owner could not be present. You're right. I stand corrected. Thank you. And I might, may I just... No, no, wait. Mr. Santori has... The given, given that there have been two continuances, one by the applicant and one by uh, Madam Hearing Examiner, there has been sufficient time uh, or since not only staff has provided the recommendation for denial to the uh, applicant um, and then has been before the body here um, with the two continuances that such material could not have been provided or been uh, questioned about. Uh, and so an additional continuance beyond that is not something that staff would support. All right, response. The first continuance that we requested in February was requested because the property owner was rushed to the hospital at four o'clock in the morning with respiratory issues. It was an emergency, an actual emergency, and now we're being asked to present additional information that is not required by the code, and we're willing to provide that. But we can't keep the record open per the city's rules. The only way that we can do that is to come back and continue the hearing. So if that is the only way we can do this, I would argue that due process and basic concepts of fairness necessitate the continuance. I don't particularly want to come back and do another hearing either, but if we have to bring in that legal description and if we have to provide this additional information and if you know we can bring in the property owner again, we're gonna need another hearing to do that, unfortunately. Well, first of all, the property owner is not here today. And so therefore, this is a hearing. Uh, I, I would presume that he would, I would assume he would want to attend. Not, not my turn. And so um, I'm not unsympathetic to his, his being rushed to the hospital. I, I truly am not. I'm, obviously, that's an emergency. But if, his hearing, if, but if his appearance is not required here today, I would think it would, his appearance would not have had to have been required in the first hearing. That's, uh, I'm sorry, at the, in the February um, scenario. So, I mean, that, that's my first thought. And I'm not trying to be harsh, but he's not here to, to testify today, so I'm not clear why. And you're the applicant, so his, the owner does not have to be here if the applicant is here. Your, your law firm is the applicant. It's, it's not that the owner is the applicant. Your firm is the applicant. So that's number one. Uh, number two, it is, um, it would be a violation of quasi-judicial rules to accept documents after the fact. It is, uh, it would be grossly improper for me to do that. It's not uh, some odd rule that the city of Cape Coral has. It is standard quasi-judicial experience. And I don't think anybody in my seven years I've been here has ever heard me say this, but I am a magistrate. I have been a magistrate. I've been a magistrate for a very, very long time. Uh, I am not currently a magistrate, but I am extremely conversant with quasi-judicial obligations, procedures, and, and violations thereof. So that, that I'm not going to honor. And the third thing that you mentioned was that um, if you are requesting the relief that you're requesting, it is, it is implied in your request that you are to provide um, information about specifics about what that is. It's, it's, not, it's not some... Um, failure on the part of the city to provide that, and it's not a failure of due process. It's just common uh, common sense. If you were to get your relief, what does it apply to? It's not, it's not, an, ex it's not an extraordinary or unusual uh, requirement. And, um, and uh, I, I, I don't agree that it, it, it literally doesn't make sense to me that, that uh, were you to prevail in this variance that we would just have, oh, the variance is granted. We have no idea what it applies to, but the variance is granted. That, that literally makes no sense to me. I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I don't get it. I really don't. Um, so my rule, go ahead. Your Honor, and, and at the last, well, applicant was entitled as a right for the Land Development Code to the first hearing, and there's no problem there. At the second hearing, when we heard this, I guess it was in February, um, Actually, it was in March. I think it was March. Yeah. March. We tried to... The, the app or... applicant rested and filed their case out. And, and the hearing examiner opened and continued the discussion and 
offered a continuance to the applicant with some questions the hearing examiner has. Is the hearing examiner again asking for additional information or is this just information that the applicant should have provided originally? That would be it. Thank you for your input. All right, final comments. Is this in regard to the continuance request? If you have any final comments to make at this time, make them. Thank you. I would request approval of the variance with the condition that it is limited to only those encroachments into the front setback as shown on the as built, nothing more. Um, we, we would be open to other conditions that you might uh, find wise in your review, Madam Hearing Examiner. Um, but ultimately, we are just simply seeking to legitimize this structure. Demolishing it, even partially, would create a hardship. It would create a one-car garage. It would still cost seven, not seven figures, six figures to, do, to undertake that project. Um, and, and quite frankly, I would argue here that the right that is being that the property owner is being deprived of is the right to make the choice as to what kind of garage is most appropriate. They're now just stuck with a one car garage. It was clearly not the intention and it's, we respectfully request that you find that there's a hardship and unique circumstances particular to the land and building in this case such that you grant the variance. Thank you. Thank you. Final comments by staff. Uh, yes, Madam Hearing Examiner, Anthony Santora, City Planning. Um, my only comment would be in regard to Councilor's comment about the burden of proof for interior dimensions. Um, specifically, all interior dimensions were taken off of the submitted and approved building plans, so I'm not sure if the insinuation is that the, or the testimony provided is that the house was not built in compliance with those plans um, specific to interior dimensions and locations and uh, with what was approved. Um, staff went through the approved plans, took the dimensions off of that. There's no reason that it should not have been built like that in the case. And if there was case for it to uh, be built, then revisions should have been submitted, which were, would have been reviewed and either approved or rejected by the city. But as far as the um, dimensioning, those are taken specifically from the approved plans with no doubt that that's how they should have been built unless there's testimony to be provided, which it sounded like there was with the insinuation that there is, uh, they are not built as such. That's all, all the only comment I had. Thank you. Well, staff mis uh, misspoke when she, and I'm sure it was inadvertent when she said the burden of proof is confident substantial evidence, burden of, of proof is preponderance of evidence, not uh, confident substantial evidence, but leaving that as it may. I am gonna close the hearing at this time. Um, I am going to uh, consider the testimony in the first hearing and the testimony in this hearing and all the documents that have been submitted, uh, but I'm not going to uh, continue the hearing. Um, it is uh, 1248. Uh, I'm close. I think I've already closed this hearing. The date and time of the next hearing is Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023 at 9 a.m. here in council chambers. We stand adjourned at 1249. Thank you, everyone.